The sun is rising on this early Monday morning in Philadelphia. What a perfect view of the Ben Franklin Bridge, the city of brotherly love, of course known for its grassroots basketball. So what better place to welcome in a brand new season than from right here at the Airport Marriott in Philly. It's American Basketball Media Day. Excited to have you waking up with us on this Monday morning as we gear up for a full day of American hoops. Alongside college basketball analyst Mike O'Donnell, I'm Haley Outen. Mike, you can feel the buzz in the room here this morning. How ready are you to dive deep into all 12 teams from top to bottom? So tired of football. Can't wait for hoop season. This is going to be a great year. I actually think five teams from the American will get in the NCAA tournament. You have a lot of storylines. Memphis, Penny, the Tigers is the hype for real. Houston, can they carry that momentum? New faces and new places. What does Cincinnati do with Coach Brandon, new coach there? A lot of exciting stuff. A lot of excitement in this room. As you can see behind us, players are getting together for a photo here on the stage right before we hear Commissioner Mike Oresco start today with his opening remarks, rather. But we have a busy day in store for you. We're going to hear from players and coaches here on the set. We're also going to hear from members of the national media. And, of course, we're going to dive deep into all 12 teams across the American Conference. Mike, moments ago it was announced that Memphis and Houston, the co-favorites to win the American this year, selected by the season's coach, coaches, initial reactions to their picks. Well, it's kind of the old adage, right? It, Memphis is probably the most talented team from an individual's perspective, but Houston might be the best overall team. So I understand why there is a tie there. That game head-to-head, -head, can't wait for that matchup. What other teams are you looking for to maybe take that next step in the American Conference this season? Well, I think Wichita State is going to be back to their roots. They missed the term for the first time last year since 2011. This team is really, really good. Might be the most underrated team in the country. And also, go down to Tampa, South Florida, the Bulls. They won the a CBI last year. Have everybody back except for one player. Love this Bulls team this season. Cincinnati with a new head coach, but the preseason player of the year, he certainly had an amazing season last year in the American, and that is Jaron Cumberland from Cincinnati. What are you expecting to see from Jaron in his senior season? Well, he's an All-American. I expect him to play like an All-American. I mean, I think he might be uh, really kind of the most underappreciated big-time player in the country, the way that he can essentially almost play four different positions. He's strong. He's physical. I don't see any reason why, barring any health issues, why he's not going to repeat for player of the year. Jaron, one of the veterans in this room, but there is a lot of buzz surrounding a freshman from Memphis, and that's in James Weissman. We haven't seen him take the court yet in college, but how much hype is surrounding him in his freshman season? Potential number one pick in the draft. Uh, so uh, naturally, it comes with a lot of hype. He is a remarkable athlete, but actually talking with the staff, their favorite thing about his game is his passing ability. So I'm not sure if he's going to average 25, 30 points a game, but you're going to see him light up the box score, 15 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists, that's the number one pick waiting to happen. When you look at this league as a whole, and we think March, even though it's only October, what are you anticipating in terms of postseason play across this league? I really think there are four locks. I think you have Memphis, Houston, Cincinnati, and Wichita State. Those four teams are locks for the tournament. I think USF is the 15 that absolutely can get in. I think worst case scenario this year for the Bulls is an NIT appearance. Also, you might want to factor in UConn and Temple. There are, you know, seven, eight teams that are going to really go after that uh, at-large bid. I think four are guaranteed to get in with another one most likely. I think it's going to be a five-bid league this year. All right, some exciting new faces around this conference taking over. Three new head coaches. Which coach are you expecting to see maybe take that great step forward with their program this season? Well, really interesting to see what Coach Brandon does at Cincinnati because he inherits a lot of talent. The Bearcats are still going to be really talented. I absolutely love the hire by Tulane. Coach Ron Hunter did a phenomenal job at Georgia State. He's bringing his matchup zone defense to the Bayou. I love that hire by Tulane. And then what does Aaron McKee do replacing the legend Fran Dunphy? He also has a lot of pieces back. Temple will be in the hunt for postseason play, but what style of play will McKee be playing? It'll be fun to watch. You see Tulane pick to finish 12th, and they have 11 newcomers on this year's roster. But there's one player that's not so new to the American Conference, and that is K.J. Lawson. He was the American's Rookie of the Year in his freshman season, but playing at Memphis. How do you anticipate his familiarity not only with the college game, but with this conference? Conference coming into play for Ron Hunter this season. Well, he, he'd be going to be sleeping in the same hotel rooms <laughs> on the road, but really you can liken him to Melvin Frazier. You Tulane fans will remember Melvin Frazier got drafted by the Magic. He was a phenomenal athlete. Similar type scenario there, except Lawson can shoot the rock. All right, well, let's get this day started. We're going to send it over to today's opening remarks.
difference in performing versus competing. You know, when you're when you're competing, you're, you're going to war. There's a difference in fighting, fighting, fighting a battle and going to war. So you wanna be a warrior? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Philadelphia. I'm Andy Katz from March Madness and NCAA.com. And a welcome to the American Basketball Men's and Women's Media Day. First part of the day will be the men's basketball coaches and players. Uh, later, lunchtime into the afternoon, we'll have the women's basketball coaches and players. Uh, the way this is going to work, uh, we're going to have uh, on live on Twitter on the American uh, Basketball Network there. You've got Haley Alton leading the coverage. Uh, I'm going to be doing some roundtables up here with uh, each of the coaches. We're going to have three sets of four for the men and the women. Uh, players and coaches are going to rotate around to uh, print and television media uh, around basically this whole conference area. And anytime you have any questions, you find uh, anyone with an A uh, representing uh, the American, Bernie, Tom, uh, Megan, they're all here for your disposal. Uh, to work with you in just a moment, Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American, will come up here with some uh, opening remarks. Uh, it's been a great run of late for this conference. We've uh, uh, they've got some incredible new co well, they've got incredible new coaches, obviously, and Ron Hunter, who's done some great work in the NCAA tournament uh, before at Georgia State. Uh, as these players know, this conference continues to be in the mix. Uh, the last couple of years. Uh, they've provided in March Madness, uh, fortunately on the wrong side, but certainly part of the drama, there's no question, and uh, part of the compelling storylines over the last couple of years. And so this league consistently is in the mix, providing multiple NCAA tournament berths, and now ready to take that next step. There's a lot of excitement, certainly, in a number of different locales around this con conference, especially uh, uh, with what Penny Hardaway is building. We're going to talk about that up here uh, this afternoon or this morning. Uh, so Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference, uh, has done a great job at uh, reforming this league over the last eight years. And he's going to just uh, open some remarks here to get our media day starting. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it and appreciate all you do. Obviously, I'm seeing our media day, but you're also a great friend to the American Athletic Conference. We appreciate the coverage that you provide for college basketball generally all season long. I want to welcome everyone to our, our 2019 Men's Basketball Media Day 2019-20 season. We're excited to be back at the Philadelphia Airport Marriott. It serves as a great venue for us and happy that so many people have, have chosen to join us. Uh, today marks the start of what I know <clears throat> is going to be a terrific year for our conference. And I could not be more excited about the upcoming season. Uh, we're a dynamic conference. Uh, we're comprised of outstanding student athletes. You're going to meet many of them today, coaches and administrators. And they're all committed to making the American Athletic Conference the best men's basketball conference in the entire country. I want to welcome our three new head coaches. John Brannon joins the Cincinnati Bearcat program. He's had four highly successful seasons as head coach at Northern Kentucky led that program to two NCAA appearances, 72 victories, two Horizon League tournament titles in his final three seasons. Ron Hunter takes over at Tulane as one of the most respected coaches in the country over a career that includes 445 victories during head coaching stops at IU, PUI, and Georgia State, a splendid career. 
and he is, uh, is we're welcoming him as well. And then last but not least, uh, Aaron McKee, a Philadelphia native who takes over at his alma mater, Temple University, obviously here in the city. A prolific scorer for the Owls, he enjoyed a 15-year career in the NBA after being chosen as the 17th overall pick in the 94 NBA draft. And following his professional playing career, he joined the 76ers as an assistant and then left to join the Temple staff under legendary head coach Fran Dunphy, so his roots in Philadelphia go very deep. John, Ron, and Aaron join an impressive roster of coaches here at the American. Uh, any conference would envy this group. We are fortunate to have them, and obviously uh, we look forward to uh, quite a season. We strive for greatness here, and I firmly believe that the future is now for this league. We had four schools, Cincinnati, UCF, Houston, and Temple, all earn NCAA tournament bids last season. We had Houston go to the Sweet 16. Memphis and Wichita State each played in the NIT. And USF won the CBI tournament, and that's a team on the move. Last season proved to be an historic season. It saw Houston win the regular season crown. And as I said, they were in the Sweet 16, and they came very close. The Cougars proved to be one of the nation's top teams under the direction of Kelvin Sampson, and their future is extremely bright. He was our coach of the year the past two seasons. The Cincinnati Bearcats won back-to-back -back tournament titles, and the UCF Knights played in the NCAA championship for the first time since 2005. And, and obviously, uh, it's bittersweet, but who could forget the way in which UCF and Coach Dawkins pushed top seed at Duke throughout that second round matchup and dropping that one-point heartbreaker. Uh, again, they did the, the conference great uh, honor, and so did, uh, did Houston in, in there, and all our tournament teams. USF head coach Brian Gregory has the Bulls on the rise, as I alluded to, and he's done an extraordinary job there. USF was one of the nation's most improved teams a year ago, and the program has tremendous momentum after winning the CBI championship. And under second-year coach Penny Hardaway, we all know the excitement that's being generated there. Memphis has enjoyed a resurgence. It's, it's sure to continue. They're welcoming the top recruiting class in the country, and obviously the entire conference is excited to not only see this team but to compete against it. Uh, kudos to the Shockers head coach Greg Marshall. He guided a very young Wichita State team to the NIT semifinals and he likes his, his young team this year. Uh, we have veteran coaches and Tim Jankovic at SMU and Frank Haith in Tulsa and they do an outstanding job and both their teams should move up in the standings this year. The Connecticut Huskies under Dan Hurley have already made incredible progress and it will only continue under Dan's leadership. Uh, the ECU Pirates under Joe Dooley have a much improved squad, and again, he's in his second season, as is uh, Dan, and, and they have retooled rosters, and they have excellent recruiting classes. Uh, I'm pleased also to mention the basketball scheduling alliance that we form with the SEC. As you know, the SEC is obviously a very highly competitive conference and had a team that almost won the national championship last year in Auburn. Uh, this partnership is going to help elevate our non-conference schedules and the additional Quadrant 1 and Quadrant 2 games are benefit, will benefit our league when tournament bids are awarded on Selection Sunday. I want to thank SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey and our old friend and former colleague Dan Leibowitz for their work and support of this initiative. Uh, they've worked very hard with Nate Pomaday to get this done. Uh, Memphis, Wichita State, Houston, and SMU are going to participate in this year's inaugural games. I look forward, as I said earlier, to a highly competitive season. It's going to culminate in Fort Worth, Texas with our men's basketball championship. You saw a brief uh, glimpse of Dickey's Arena. Everybody who has seen this arena says it is absolutely state of the art. It's an incredible place. Uh, the thing I like about it, it is within driving distance and an easy flight uh, for so many of our schools, and, and that's going to mean tremendous attendance and excitement at our tournament. It's a state-of-the-art venue, and it will, it will play host to our tournament the next three years. I think it's going to provide an outstanding atmosphere and experience for our, our players, our student-athletes, uh, our coaches, administrators, and again, I think our fans are going to love it. I think they'll, they'll show up in great numbers. I want to thank our friends from ESPN and CBS Sports for joining us today. We're grateful for their steadfast support of our conference, and it's been terrific. As you all know, we concluded a landmark 12-year television media deal with ESPN this past year. It begins in 2020-21, and we're very pleased about that, obviously. 
Uh, we also enjoy uh, terrific broadcast coverage from CBS, the longtime NCAA tournament rights holder, my old network, as is ESPN. I, I, I worked at both of them. Um, and CBS Sports Network also does an excellent job televising our games. So we're quite happy that uh, we've got representatives from uh, those networks here today. Jeff Wilson and Matt Bartley are here from ESPN. Dan Weinberg, Bess Barnes, and Mariel Brady are here from CBS Sports and CBS Sports Network. And as I said, we value these partnerships. And I want to just emphasize what tremendous exposure we get being on basically the gold standard with CBS and ESPN in terms of basketball and ESPN with our overall rights deal. This is a, a tremendous exposure for our conference. And by the way, it has helped over the last eight years, really, to build this, this conference, to build this brand. I don't think there's any question now that we are in the forefront of collegiate conferences and, and the great exposure we get is a big part of that, but also what you, the teams, have achieved. Uh, and and I, I salute our student athletes in all sports. But today is devoted to basketball, and, and I'm very pleased that obviously we can all be here and, and talk about the upcoming season. You also may have noticed that our student athletes, coaches, and the conference staff, including me, are wearing a green uh, lapel uh, ribbon today. This is to show our support for the conference, conference's Student Athlete Advisory Committee's Powerful Minds Initiative, and that's a student-led initiative. It tips off a week-long series of events at all of our schools this week. Its primary focus is to raise awareness of student and student-athlete mental health issues and the resources available to students and student-athletes. It also is designed to end any stigma related to seeking help. This is such an important issue. You know, we want to promote success through healthy, powerful minds as well as healthy bodies. You know, we talk a lot about nutrition. We talk a lot about the weight room. We talk a lot about these things. But mental health and well-being is, is very, very important. And sometimes we don't give it the attention it deserves. I couldn't be prouder to wear this pin today. And I, I really compliment our SAC group for making this one of their top priorities. I want to, uh, again, give a shout out again to Nate Pomade, He oversees our men's basketball. Uh, and Bernie Caffarelli, who you all know, and, and she runs our communications. Their staffs do an outstanding job, not only putting together this event, but making sure uh, that you get excellent coverage all season long. And, and their hard work and dedication does pay off throughout the year. And as always, I want to thank my executive assistant, all, all of you know, Lisa Zanekia, uh, for her terrific work in organizing today's media day. Uh, please enjoy the opportunities uh, for the media here that you'll have to meet and speak with our players and coaches and a fine group of people, and they represent our conference so well. Uh, thanks for your support of our conference. We appreciate it very much. If there's anything you need throughout the day, you know, please let us know, let me know, let Bernie know, and uh, we'll do anything we can to help. Uh, again, to our student athletes and coaches, thanks for all you do, the exemplary way you represent us and represent this conference. I wish all of our teams the best. I look forward to a really memorable season, and I think it's going to be one in the American. And good luck, one and all. Thank you. Thanks for joining us live here at American Basketball Media Day in Philadelphia. We're now joined on the set by March Madness's and NCAA's very own Andy Katz, Mike O'Donnell, Haley Outen. Happy to have you with us, Andy. First and foremost, let's take a look at the preseason coaches poll that was announced just a few minutes ago. Houston and Memphis pick to win it at number one. What's your initial reaction to that pick? Well, I think it's obviously what should have happened, so it's good when uh, you see that all play out. Uh, uh, that wasn't the case in a conference I was at last week where I didn't think it the, I thought the media sort of uh, picked the team that should have won it. Uh, a little favoritism there. But this is actually, you could really go in either direction. Uh, Memphis clearly has more talent. Mike and Haley, uh, but they don't have the experience. With Houston being picked as the as the top team, a lot of that is being banked on what they've built over the last couple of years. Their defense, uh, they do have some experience, not as much as they've had the last two seasons, but I think a lot of that's a credit to what Kelvin Sampson has uh, built. What I'm also really interested in is, uh, and I'm going to be wrong on a team here, I'm going to just admit it right now, <laughs> because in the summer, in the preseason, uh, and I know I'm going to hear about this from Greg Marshall. I wasn't as high on Wichita. I've now come around, and I'm going to be wrong on Wichita because I agree. 
that they should be somewhere in that top five. Yeah, I think Wichita State's backcourt could be one of the best backcourts in the conference. Um, really good. I'm also a huge fan of what Coach Gregory has yes. done in South Florida. I think, you know, they, you know, with their size and strength and how they just beat teams up defensively, when it coming off winning the CBI, they only lose one player from last year's team. That's and they got one of the most underappreciated point guards in all of college basketball in Rito. And Alexis Yenta yeah. may end up being one of the more undervalued bigs yeah. in the country. Yeah. I mean, he clearly uh, you know does his work on the backboard, and I think just they just haven't had the national recognition that they deserve. They've done a good job with their schedule. I know you guys will talk various things about that throughout the course of the day, but you know, a game like they're playing Utah State. Um, in Texas in a neutral, I think it's in Houston. And that's a great example of picking up a game against a team that is going to be in the NCAA tournament, likely to win the Mountain West Conference. And if you win that, come March, that's the kind of win that'll be on your resume, that'll be a quad one probably. And so they've done a good job of trying to do that. You also got to beat those teams like Boston College at yes, home too. Yes. You got to take care of that business. The bottom as well. teams right. in some of the major conferences. Yep. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the preseason poll for a second because when you look at seven, eight, and nine, you have Temple, SMU, and UCF. Two of those teams made the NCAA tournament last season. So when you see them in the bottom half of the league, what does that say about the American heading into this season? Well, no, there's great depth. There's no question about it. Uh, I, I would say that really from seven on up, uh, and I wouldn't discount SMU, but those seven, well, let's go eight. Let's go eight. I think the first eight enter the season firmly believing they have a chance to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, I just saw Frank Cave from the hallway, and he says, you know, we're better than people think. So there's Tulsa probably believing that. UCF, it's hard to know what we're going to get from them because they just were, they were so, they were older last year, and obviously they had an unbelievable game against Duke. But, um, you know, sort of, the, there's a reshuffle going on in, uh, in Orlando, so we don't know. But um, the rest of the league, I think, enters the season feeling like they have a chance. You mentioned how important scheduling is, and let's take a look at the non-conference schedule of the games on the non-conference side, Andy, this year. What really stands out to you as a match to circle up? Well, right off the bat, I'll tell you, November 17th, I'm looking forward, I'm going to be at that game. Uh, Florida is my pick, actually, to get to one of the teams to get to the Final Four. I mean, they are loaded. Uh, they picked up Kerry Blackshear, a uh, junior transfer from Virginia Tech. So they're a team that if UConn gets a win like that, you know, uh, that's the kind of thing that's going to have shelf life for the Huskies, a team that you would think sort of enters the season a little bit on the bubble. You're not quite sure where they fit. So that's number one. I love the VCU Wichita State game. Uh, I think they played years ago when they used to have the bracket buster. It was like a fun Sweet yes. 16 game. Kind and of, VCU, yeah. they're going to either be one or two in the Atlantic 10. So a great game for Wichita State, a sleeper game. You know, Wichita State, Oklahoma State, I think Oklahoma State's going to be better than people think in the Big 12. And then, of course, Cincinnati Xavier always uh, is uh, one of the best games of the year because the rivalry you got Jaron Cumberland against Najee Marshall. Uh, that'll be, you know, just another uh, obviously great game in the Queen City. What is the biggest storyline you're tracking on here today? Well, I think, first of all, Memphis. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to talk to some of these guys. I've had a chance in the offseason to talk to them as well. Um, you know, the way they're going to handle basically not having that kind of experience that you could potentially have five freshman starters. Um, you know, I think back to 2012, not necessarily, you know, I don't want to go all the way back to the early 90s with Fab Five. I think back more to 2012 with Kentucky. Uh, that's the last time we've seen a freshman dominated team win the national championship. Uh, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking that they're going to be potentially that good, and they may be because they've got an Anthony Davis-like player in James Weissman uh, who could en end up being the number one draft pick in June. So, you know, how they handle not having that veteran leadership, that's going to be a big question for them. But just even just talking to them about how they're handling it, and I love the fact that they're here. You know, I, you yep. shouldn't be afraid to bring your best players. Some leagues, some schools don't do that. I'm glad they're doing it here. Everybody's searching for those illustrious quad one wins, yes. but now you've got the American SEC Alliance. So what does that do from a scheduling standpoint to help the American? Well, they've got to do stuff like this because so many of these other leagues are going to 20 games. Um, and so the SEC hasn't gone there yet, uh, but Big Ten, ACC, uh, Pac-12, you know, all these school uh, conferences are moving to that or already have done it. In terms of games that are going to be critical here, these four, 
uh, I would say the first three. Uh, nothing against Vandy, but more than likely they're going to be at the bottom of the SEC. And we don't know about SMU, as I said, up, up top. But I think these, these top three games right here are going to have tremendous value. Houston and South Carolina. South Carolina finished fourth last season in the SEC. Didn't make the NCAA tournament. Uh, Frank Martin thinks he's got a tournament team. Could be a great road win for Houston. Georgia at Memphis. you got Anthony Edwards, James Weissman, and you've got a Bulldog team that I think will be probably somewhere in the bubble uh, for out of the SEC. Ole Miss, another team that I was wrong. These, that's like the that's a Andy Katz game. Wrong, game, wrong, <laughs> wrong call game here on January 4th because I downplayed Ole Miss and Wichita State. I think they're both teams better than a lot of people think. Andy, you mentioned Memphis, but Houston also a favorite in the conference this season. And last year we asked ourselves, how would Houston move on without Rob Gray? And they ended up making that run to the Sweet 16. Where is Kelvin Sampson's group position heading into this season? Well, they've established themselves as a regular contender. Sold out their season tickets, first time ever. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when, uh, you know, at Houston, it was just friends and family. I mean, it just they just didn't draw anyone. And now they've got beautiful facility. They're drawing people. There's a buzz uh, about that team in a market where it's hard to get, you know, because the, the oxygen's all being taken by now the Astros and obviously the Rockets. Uh, so for Houston to get a footprint into that city, uh, it just shows what he's done. And, and, and let's be honest, he could have left. Uh, Kelvin Sampson had opportunities to leave, but it's become a family operation. His son Kellen's on the staff. His daughter Lauren uh, is basically, you know, makes everything move within the the real the office. boss of that yes, operation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and Karen, her, you know, his wife is sort of uh, the matriarch of the whole thing. So it's been become a family atmosphere there, and uh, I see why now he stayed. All right, well, Andy, thanks so much for joining us. And don't forget, you can head over to Twitter and catch Andy Katz with three coaches' roundtable sessions, and that's at American underscore MBB. Thanks so much, Andy. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. We now welcome in the commissioner of the American, Mike Oresco. Mike, thanks for joining us. When you look back to last year, seven American teams made the postseason, four to the NCAA tournament. How important and significant is that growth for this conference? Well, it's huge. First of all, great to have Andy, too, here. You know, And he's right about Houston. And... Um, Kelvin's wife makes those cookies that they featured on uh, game day. <laughs> yeah. I, I said to her, I saw her at one of the games, I said, you know, I would love to have had some of those. <laughs> they looked absolutely delicious. No, it, it means a lot, obviously. There's no question that, uh, you know, having having four teams make the tournament and do well in the tournament. You know, we, we came within an inch, as you know, and, and unfortunately uh, it, it's good and bad because a few years ago, you know, we had another situation where Houston could have beaten Michigan and Cincinnati was looked like they were going to advance. We've come awfully close to going very, very deep in the tournament, but you saw what our teams can do. When you take Kentucky to the limit, you take Duke to the limit, uh, we're a really good conference. I think the entire country was watching that UCF Duke game uh -huh. last year. I mean, it was just an incredible atmosphere, but it just speaks to kind of the power to this conference that it has nationally. And then you look at some of the new hi hires that have come in. I thought an unbelievable hire by Tulane with Ron Hunter. You get Coach Brandon, just, he drove about 15 minutes over to Cincinnati. I mean, he did a phenomenal job in Northern Kentucky, but it's pretty cool to see a former Temple player, Aaron McKee, take over for a legend in Fran Dunphy at Temple. It'd be really fun to watch him uh, participate this year with the Owls. I agree, Mike. We've hired really good coaches, and uh, when you really look at uh, the local roots of some of the coaches, that's important. You know, John Brandon will do really well at Cincinnati. Mike Bone has made some great hires. Oh, yeah. Luke Fickle and now, now John. Uh, Ron Hunter, Aaron McKee. Aaron has got, you know, the pedigree that you want, just like Penny Hardaway in Memphis. He's got that incredible pedigree. People in the market know him. People in the city know him. People respect him. Uh, both of those coaches. Uh, Ron, uh, getting him in our conference is a coup. And, and let's not forget Joe Dooley and what I think Joe's going to accomplish at ECU. I think it's just a matter of time. The biggest turnaround in the country, 11 new players. Yeah, and, and you know, he did it before there. Uh, he got him to the tournament once, and he knows the, the market, too. They, they all know and love Joe. And I think it's really important to have coaches who have a real connection, and we do. And we've just got great coaches. I mean, Kelvin Sampson, to have Kelvin in our league. You know, one of the things that's been fortunate for us in basketball, we keep our coaches a lot longer than we've been able to keep them in football, you know, and, and it's hard to make that transition from time to time. And we've done it successfully in football, but it's not easy. Whereas in basketball, uh, you know, we, we have such tremendous tradition and, and pedigree. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Andy was talking about Houston. 
Well, yeah, there were. It, 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 it was fallow for some years, and all of a sudden now, people remember Phi Slamma Jamma. This had a great tradition here in Houston. You know, I went there seven years ago. I was talking to Kelvin earlier today, and I remember seeing the facilities and, and the. And I thought, boy, there's work to be done here. And they did it. You know, give give Renew, Couture credit, you know, Tillman Fertitta, what they've done at Houston with the incredible practice facility and now the Fertitta Center, which is state of the art. I loved it. I mean, it didn't have suites. You know, it had a, it had a Cameron indoor feel to it. I loved it. So all around the league, things are happening. And, of course, you know, obviously, uh, I wouldn't call it the elephant in the room because that's not the, the right way to do it. But we all know that, you know, Memphis, everybody's excited. I think the whole league's excited about Memphis. They're excited to see Memphis, to play Memphis. Yeah. Uh, you, when you have the top recruiting class in the country in your league, just like after 14, we had the trophy. We had the NCAA championship trophy in our room for media day. It's pretty exciting. You mentioned the buzz around Memphis, and we had the great fortune of having the conference tournament in Memphis last season. What was your impression in Penny Hardaway's first season, showing up in Memphis for that week and seeing that excitement surrounding that program? Incredible, Haley. You know, the attendance was the biggest uh, increase of any place in the country, and no surprise. You know, Penny's Memphis, and, you know, Penny walked the walk. You know, Penny played at Memphis. Penny is, is highly respected there, and he has a calm manner that it really inspires confidence. What I was so impressed with last year, you know, people said, well, you know, Penny hasn't coached at this level. You know, what's going to happen? Well, that team was extremely well coached, and, you know, they've got Mike Miller, and they've got a bunch of, of good assistants, and they took Houston to the limit, you know, in the uh, tournament. And I was there for that game. And uh, I just think what he's done is remarkable. It's only going to get better. That, you know, you're going to see crowds of 15, 18,000 pretty routinely. I think that team is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, again, you also have a great league to compete in. You know, every, every coach here is terrific. This is the first time I can remember where I look up and see a, a, you know, just an incredible roster of coaches top to bottom, oh, yeah. even at some of our programs that have struggled. I mean, Brian Gregory's a little under the radar still, but he did a fine job at USF, and they're going to be one of our best teams, you know. Uh, you know, I got to meet LaQuincy Rideau, and, and, you know, I got to meet some of the players, and I think they're all very excited about what's going to happen this year. Yeah, I think USF is two years ahead of schedule, actually. <laughs> um, but you just talked about the conference tournament. We've got a new conference tournament coming down the pipe uh, in terms of location. How excited are you to move to Texas? Well, I can't wait to see it, first of all. And, you know, as Haley knows, we're moving the office. Uh, it'll coincide with the tournament. You know, next, next uh, early summer we'll be moving the office to Dallas, to a building in Las Colinas. And uh, the Dickies Arena is apparently absolutely state of the art. In fact, we heard that I think it's, uh, for, is, it, is it George Strait maybe? I think it's George Strait. <laughs> You know, I, I don't, it's, it's not Garth Brooks. I think it's George Strait. Well, Mike loves country music. No, I don't say, yeah, well, George you know, Strait's a legend. I, I like yeah. country music, yeah. but I, I know the legends. And uh, apparently he is not going to use his own sound group. He, the, the, the acoustics in that arena are so good. That's what I heard. Oh, wow. You know, it could be, it's hearsay, but I heard that that's going to happen. It is apparently an absolutely gorgeous arena. It's beautiful. Uh, but again, as I, uh, you know, alluded to in my, uh, my talk, when you have fan bases that can drive and you have fan bases like Wichita's, right, and Memphis's, and you have Tulsa up the road, and you have SMU right there, and you have Houston just a short either flight or drive away and Tulane, uh, and it's not really hard to get to Dallas from, from Florida or Cincinnati or, or Temple. You have a chance to really maximize attendance, which is something we really want to do. You want to see an exciting, you know, you know, jam-packed arena, and that's what I think you're going to see at Dickey's. Plus, you're going to see great competition. I think our tournament's going to be one of the more exciting ones. If these teams are as good as we think they're going to be, then I think it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of schools within driving distance, so hopefully fans take that opportunity to come out to the conference tournament to see their favorite teams. Mike, something that we're seeing on the football side this year is a lot of parity, certainly a lot of teams that are making a viable case to host and be in that conference championship. And you could argue very similar on the basketball side this year. Um, how impactful is that to have a team from, or a league rather, from top to bottom where you have teams competing, maybe a one-two loss team playing in that conference championship? Well, here's the thing, Haley, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I've talked about that recently because, you know, people have asked me, they said, well, in football, for example, you, you might not have uh, the New Year's team this year, you know, the New Year's Day team because somebody else in one of these G5 conferences can go through undefeated. Your league is brutal. You know, you've got top to bottom. You've got so many good teams. I mean, we've got nine teams that you could argue are as good as, you know, most in, in the country. Well, I said I'd rather have that kind of depth 
I think it's much more important that the conference be perceived as strong top to bottom than to have just one, one elite team or one top team. You don't want to be a one horse league. You really don't, or even a two horse league. This league in basketball now, I think is going to have multiple really good teams. It's not just one team, it's not just Memphis. If it were just Memphis, I'd be disappointed. This is going to be a good league. No one's going to, going to, going to rip through it and, and win all the games. I don't believe now. People are arguing that Memphis is going to go undefeated. I think you know the one thing you got to be careful about is that these expectations get a little outsized well, at times. It's hard to do in men's hoops. Yeah, yeah they get outsized. You know, yeah. everybody says, "Well, this could be like Kentucky back, you know, several years ago." Let's just see how it plays out. You know, this is an outstanding team. It's going to have to grow a little bit. But the point is, to, to your point, uh, Haley, there's no question you'd rather be good and, and balanced. And we are in football, and we are in basketball, and we're getting there in women's basketball too. We're starting to see that there. What's well, a trickle down effect for recruiting too? So mm -hmm. when Penny goes on the road and he gets three, four McDonald's All Americans, and he out recruits Duke and Kentucky. I mean, Houston, Cincinnati, Wichita State, when they're on the road, that elevates the conference even that much more than it already was. So it, it, we always talk about the impact it has from an NCAA tournament perspective. But when you get a school like Memphis and a coach like Penny who brings in the number one recruiting class, that helps Houston, Wichita State, South Florida, you see everybody elevate their recruiting efforts. I mean, this is going to end up being, I think it's going to be a five-bid league this year. I hope so, Mike. I mean, I, I do think, though, that, that that kind of attention is going to help recruiting. I don't think there's any question about it. And, and, and you know, what, what I like is the mix of coaches we have. We've got some, some younger fellows who obviously were great players and are part of their communities, like Aaron and, and like Penny and others. But then we have veterans like Kelvin Sampson who've been to Final Fours, you know, been on the cusp of winning national championships. You know, you have a veteran like Johnny Dawkins. You have Frank Haith who's coached in the SEC, coached in other places. And, you know, you always forget to mention some people. But also, uh, I'll give our, our ADs credit for hiring, you know, these coaches. And, you know, Mike Bones done a great job. Now he's got Luke Fickle. I think John Brandon is going to be terrific. I really think that's a great hire to hire a local fellow who's really had success. You know, Tulane athletics too. What they're doing in football, oh, and then the hire I love with it. Ron Hunter. There, it's, I think it's a home run hire for Tulane. I, I love it. They've yeah. re they've really made a commitment to their athletic programs, and you know, and and uh, you know, if you look at um, SMU, what they did to capture Dallas. Now they're doing it in football. We hope they can get back in basketball because I went down there a few years ago, and you know, every Dallas Cowboy was there, and Jerry Jones, and. You know, obviously President Bush, you know, W lo loves to, to go to the game, so it's one of his most favorite experiences. So, you know, SMU, when, when they're uh, moving on all cylinders, they capture the city. You know, they're starting to they put Dallas on their football uniforms. You know, they were Dallas's team. Uh, that's really important. Uh, Houston, look what they've done. I mean, come on, you know, it's been a long time. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I'll, you know, and Haley knows I've talked about this a lot. This league enabled this to happen because the league has the kind of dynamic and the kind of teams it makes everybody better. It, you know, if, if you were playing in a league that doesn't get TV exposure, I talked about that, that TV exposure is huge. And let's face it, we get some of the best, period. And if you didn't have that, you're not gonna, you can't be part of a narrative if nobody knows what you're doing. And that's what fortunately has, has worked for us in football and basketball. Well, thank you, Mike, so much for your time and looking forward to a great day here in Philadelphia. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's really upbeat, uh, Haley, and it was last year, too, but I'm really excited. And thank you for the job you do. Uh, we really uh, enjoy having you and uh, you're one of ours, of course, but we thank really you. have and you do a great job, really. And Mike, always a pleasure. A Say hi to Annie, ride, you know, I Annie, love you know Mike and uh, Mike and Annie, they, they're old friends. And, you know, I tell them, you know, he's got a young family now. I know what that's like, and I'm glad I don't have to do that now. But so it, tired. you wouldn't trade it for anything, but it, it tires you. Out, so I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> but right, thanks cool. for having me, guys. Thanks a lot, Mike. You know, speaking of Media Day, Mike, we're here in Philadelphia at the Airport Marriott, and not a lot of people at home get to see how this situation kind of all comes together. But most people flew in yesterday, planes landed, walked through the terminal, ended up right here in the Marriott. You actually don't even have to step outside during this uh, two-day stretch in Philadelphia. It's all right here for you. Well, thank goodness because it's so cold outside, <laughs> and I'm from Orlando, and it's still 90 Wouldn't degrees want Mike outside. To be cold. Oh yeah, my gosh, that would yeah, be it's terrible. brutal. It's brutal, but it's it's fun for me. This is you know uh, just more personal. When we travel up north, it gets kind of cool. It means it's called troop season, and that's what the really exciting thing. And to have it in Philly, where, where basketball is so prevalent especially at the high school level, it's a really special time. A little fall in the air, making it feel like hoop season. The commissioner touched on it 
the conference championship headed to Fort Worth for the next three years. We're kind of we've kind of gotten used to the conference tournament moving around a bit, but having it in Fort Worth for the next three seasons and having that consistency, how do you expect fans to kind of pick up on that? Can it become kind of a yearly trip to watch an American basketball? I think so. Centralized location, everything's bigger in Texas, and, and it's an opportunity to really kind of centralize the media for that particular week, which that week has been just such great basketball. I think the national level really going to take notice. All right, well, looking forward to March, but that's a long ways away. We're here to talk about the upcoming season. It's only October. We're now joined here on the set by Memphis head coach Penny Hardaway and freshman center James Weissman. To both of you, thanks so much for taking a few time, or taking some time here rather early in the day. Coach, starting with you, first season with all of your recruits, what do you anticipate the identity of this team to be now that you kind of have your guys here in place? Yeah, uh, we're young, but uh, we're athletic and they're actually pretty good, so... I think my identity this year, I really want it to be about toughness and, uh, and being the fastest team in our league for sure. Get all those pieces together. It's inc a lot of talent, and you don't have to go into great detail. You're not trying to give away the, you know, the soup kitchen right. here. You know? But how do you get all these great offensive and defensive talents? It's a lot of, there's only one ball, there's a, but there's one court, and so you've got to be able to mix that the right way. What's that been like in practice so far? Well, I think it's, it's been big. Uh, it's been good for us because all of these kids came in talking about sacrifice. That's the biggest word because they have to sacrifice. And with us playing as fast as we play, we're, we're challenging these kids to play as hard as they can for three or four minutes. They should be raising their hand after that to be coming out of the game. The next person up, next man up, and that's, that's what we're doing. Highly talented recruit James Weissman in the house with us, man. That's the intro you need. Haley didn't give you a good enough intro there, man. I'm sorry. But so you've got a lot of hype around Memphis. Um, and it, it's really kind of on a national level. Every, all eyes are on you right now, your teammates, your coach, everything. But you strike me as the type of individual blocking that noise out. You know, how do you do that? Because not everybody can do that. I'm really just focusing more on the team instead of myself. Uh, I know that everybody has a lot of expectations coming, coming from a personal standpoint. But if we just buy in to the process and really just try to make each other better every day in practice, then we can be a special team. In just your short amount of time so far at Memphis, what have you been able to just absorb from some of the players around you to help get you ready for this season? Uh, the intensity, the competitive nature for sure, uh, everybody going after it, just trying to buy into the process, make sure that we leave our egos at the door. Sacrifice is a key word that Coach P said, and really just trying to have fun. So when you're, when you're at home visiting with mom and dad and James and everybody, uh, what is the, what's the Memphis recruiting pitch now? I think uh, a lot of times, well, all of the kids that we've recruited lately, they want to go to the next level, and it's all about development. Obviously, we're a high academic school in our minds because we had, our team last year had a 2.9 GPA, and uh, that's pretty 3.0. And uh, we tell the parents, hey, academically, we're good. I check classes. I check study hall as a coach. So it's that serious to me. But the development and the teaching um, from myself, from Coach Miller, from Coach Matlock, and last year Coach Mitchell and now Coach Topper, we're just developing and teaching, and, you know, they, they love that, that we're saying that to them. Coach Topper does not have a better jump shot than me. I'm going to make sure you go back and tell him that. Uh, I don't know just, about just that. Telling, Mike, telling this isn't about it. you today. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Coach, four players from East High in Memphis, six players from that city. With your coaching background in the city of Memphis at the youth level, how far does your coaching go back with some of these young faces that we'll see suit up this season? Uh, well, it goes back as far as sixth grade with Alex Lomax, which is crazy. I've been When I retired, I started coaching middle school. Then I started coaching AAU, so I started meeting some of these kids back then. Never would have known that it would have gone to this, this level because I didn't think that I would be the coach at Memphis now. So uh, it's been great uh, building those relationships and keeping those relationships and, uh, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to keeping them going forward as we're in the university. What were some of those key takeaways for you with, on, with your team when you guys went down for, to the Bahamas for that trip? Yeah, I think uh, we actually went down without James and without Precious. Uh, they were injured. Uh, and obviously pressures can go because of a visa issue. But, you know, I think the, the big things that I took away from that was that we, we could be really good, We're really fast. Uh, we could make, put multiple lineups out there. We played really small, and we played great really small because our smalls can rebound the basketball. So uh, that taught us a lot about our team and uh, that, we're, that we're, you know, they're competitive because the national team was really good, and we got down as much as 11. Fought back in that game without James and Precious and won that game, so that, that taught us a lot. With what could be a very young starting five, how do you as a, as a coach get your players mentally ready to adjust to the college game? A player like James, you have 18-year-olds going up against what could be 22 or 23-year-olds that have been playing for a while. Yeah, I, I've been talking about that to them every day, but honestly, experience is going to be the best teacher. All we can do is just try to tell them what's going to be ahead, show them film from the teams that we played the year before, show them what's, uh, what they're going to be facing, and uh, it's up to them to, to get mentally ready. We'll have them physically ready, but mentally ready is going to be up to them. 
So everybody's going to talk about your athleticism and how great you are offensively, but everything I'm hearing about you and what I've watched in high school is you've got a great passing ability. So I'm going to ask you to do is kind of dish it to a couple of your teammates here. Who are a couple of the guys maybe that the national media isn't talking about that you've been in practice you're like, that guy can really go? Um, Lance Thomas, uh, Alex Lomax, Tyler Harris. Really, really everybody on our team is very talented. So I feel that uh, everybody's not getting as much recognition as they deserve. But uh, I feel that this year is going to turn around tremendously because everybody's going to witness it. So, yeah. Coach, in your eyes, what will be the impact of Tyler Harris this season? Tyler Harris is a weapon. He's a guy, obviously, that, um, you know, last year because we didn't have as much depth that they kind of took him out of the game with just putting somebody on him. This year it's going to be a little more difficult because we have inside, outside presence. But him, his impact is what he's showing right there. He can really shoot the basketball at a high level. And uh, it's going to be uh, better for him this year because the floor will be more space and they just can't, you know, guard him out there like they did last year. He averaged over 15 points a game in that trip to the Bahamas. What did you see from him in terms of growth over the summer? Well, he's matured, you know, a lot. Obviously, last year being in his first year, it was uh, an experience for him. Uh, coming into this year, he understands that everybody is going to try to, we're going to try to uh, make him that priority to not let him shoot. But having James now, having Precious, getting Lance Thomas eligible is going to make it a lot more difficult for them to do that. And he's happy about that. How about Isaiah Maurice? What, what, what's the next step for him in his game this year? Isaiah is one of our better outside shooters uh, on the perimeter. He's a guy that we have to get in, in the game to get, you know, those uh, the stress the defense. You know, when they got those bigs last year, obviously against UCF, when, when Taco was out there, we put him on the perimeter and he did great. But Isaiah has a ton of talent. It's just getting that talent out this year. We heard James mention kind of blocking out that noise and dealing with that hype that is surrounding your program that, this season. How crucial, how vital is it going to be for your young players to really just focus on themselves as you look forward to the season ahead. Yeah, it's going to be difficult because of social media, because of family, because of friends, and you're going to always have people in your ear about doing certain things, but you have to block it out and you have to put team first, and that's going to be the biggest challenge for us because we're so young. Coach, before we let you leave, last year we got to go to Memphis for the conference tournament and see those fans come out and support your team in what was a really nice run for your program. Just in the past year or so since you've taken over, how have you seen that Memphis fan base become re-energized? Well, you know, it, it happened instantly. When I took over the job, the city just got on fire, and uh, I'm always appreciative of our fans because, you know, the fans, you know, as we go, that's how the fans go. If we're winning, they're happy. If we're, if we're losing, they're sad. So we're the heartbeat of the city for the uh, – for the uh, university is and uh, to have those amazing fans is a, is a blessing for us. Well, thanks so much, Penny. Thank you, James. Best of luck to you and the Memphis Tigers this season. Thank Appreciate you. it. Mike, when you look at Memphis and the season to come, number one recruiting class to go along with some very good returners and some red shirts. How is this team positioned looking ahead to this season? Well, ultra talented, as we just talked about. You know, I think from top to bottom, this is the team that can play inside and outside. But really, at the end of the day, you're going to see a lot of NBA concepts for this Memphis team. It's not going to be your just normal pick and roll set plays. It is going to be anything other than boring basketball. They're going to get up and down, run, play physical. They want a track meet but also you'll see five out on the perimeter as well putting players in position to make plays players will have up to three reads it's almost a little bit read react at an NBA concept level I can't wait to watch it and break it down this year Memphis could potentially have the depth the talent the athleticism will they have the maturity well you just you know we had an opportunity to talk with coach Penny Hardaway he seems pretty mature to me and I thought he did a great job last year as well and I think they're going to be fine. I think when you put talent in place from a confidence standpoint and you give them an opportunity to prove themselves with accountability, that's what Coach Penny Hardaway is going to try to do. And there's plenty of talent to win a lot of games this season. All right. Could be a very exciting year in Memphis. We're going to throw it to a quick break. But when we come back, we've got a whole lot more to talk about here at American Men's Basketball Media Day. The American is committed to ending the stigma related to seeking help for mental health conditions. If you have a mental health condition, no, you're not alone. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health issues in the United States, and more than 30% of student athletes have experienced overwhelming anxiety. Listen to your teammates and others about what they are going through. Think about the words you choose, avoid labels, and use stigma-free language when communicating. Build and use support systems with friends and family. Asking for help can be difficult, but seeking help to improve your health, academic, or athletic performance or another goal is a sign of strength. Hope. Educate. Awareness. Listen. Talk. Help. 
There are resources on your campus and in your community for help. The American, building healthy, powerful minds. Happy to have you with us live in the beautiful city of Philadelphia as we gear up for what could be a very exciting season across the American Athletic Conference. Alongside Mike O'Donnell, I'm Haley Outen. Mike, as we look ahead to the upcoming season, we had the commissioner talk about it just a few moments ago, but this year's conference tournament is headed to Fort Worth, Texas, and it's going to be there for the next three years. How exciting is it to be the first conference tournament to actually get to play in that arena? Well, I'm even more excited now that Mike talked about George Strait and he doesn't <laughs> even need to bring his own sound equipment because Pretty the cool. arena is so state of the art. It's exciting that when you can centralize something in Texas, you know, from a media standpoint, that's a big deal. You know, I, I understand why I think some fans may be like, well, we'd like to have it at particular uh, school locations. But centralized in Texas when you've got Houston, SMU, Easy Drive for Memphis, Wichita State, and actually Tulane as well. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty quick drive over there. I think it's going to be an awesome venue. I can't wait to see it. I've never been to it before. I don't think you've been to it either. I have not so yet. So it's going to be really exciting to see that presence because the concerts that they get in that arena, you know, it's always the top build concerts and I heard it's state of the art. Yeah, these are some pretty recent shots at Dickey's, looking at Dickey's Arena. It's going to be a 14,000 seat arena. Almost done. They're going to start incorporating some games in that arena over the next couple of months, but the first conference tournament will be that one right there that you see March 12th through the 15th, and that is the American Conference Tournament. Pretty neat though, Mike. Six of the Americans' 12 members are located within driving distance. Uh, how much of a missed opportunity is this for fans if they don't make that trip to support their team? It's a huge missed yeah. opportunity. I'm a <laughs> chance to travel to Dickies Arena and watch your team, but you know, I look at a look at a school like Wichita State that travels. They travel so well, well anywhere where the tournament is, and this drive being that close, I mean, you're going to have thousands of Shocker fans. I know that's an you fly right into Dallas. I live in Orlando. UCF fans, that's an easy flight. Southwest takes you there for about a hundred bucks. It's a piece of cake. Mike, I know you're a big food guy, and a discussion that we've been having yeah. weekly on the football side this year has been regarding barbecue. We obviously have schools located all over the country. You have the Carolinas, you have Tennessee, you have Texas. Some good barbecue in a lot of these regions. What is your favorite? Oh, so far Memphis barbecue, but I say that with a grain That's of salt. That's not going with the Fort Worth theme. Here. I, I'm not. I'm, I, I, I have <laughs> not, not experienced Fort Worth barbecue yet. Kansas City barbecue is also pretty fantastic. So you're Wichita State fans, don't forget. <laughs> not forgetting about Kansas. But can't wait for some barbecue, right? Yeah. I mean, that's going to be awesome. That'll, uh, that will be the perfect way to fuel up for what will be a very uh, few days in Fort Worth. So looking forward to that. All right, let's move on and continue the conversation. Let's talk ECU. Picked to finish 11th in this season's preseason poll. Uh, second year head coach Joe Dooley at the helm. And ECU, Mike, they only return one starter from last season, but it's a pretty good one. It's American all freshman forward Jaden Gardner. And you had a chance to catch up with him last night in Philadelphia. All right, Jaden, a lot of new faces for the Pirates. 11 new players for East Carolina this year. So summer, preseason practice, what has it been like getting all the new, go new guys acclimated to your system? Uh, it's been a grind. Most of, the, most, of the, most of the guys have never been through the stuff that uh, college athletes go through, and it's, uh, it's a grind. So they're just getting used to it and getting mentally prepared and coaches being hard on them, but it's for the better. Who's one of the new guys that uh, might surprise Pirate Nation? Uh, probably, probably Batumba. And why is that? Uh, he's versatile, can play one through four. Uh, just a versatile player. Speaking of versatile, if I told you you had an old man YMCA game, would you take offense to that? No. Right, exactly. I, I love your game because you play back to the basket, 10 feet away, 14 feet away. Where did you learn that style of play? Because a lot of guys don't play like you play. Uh, just going out and being myself, like doing the things that, that you know that you do best. So that's what I've always been doing since AAU, since I was little. It's the most underrated player in the country, Jaden Gardner. Mike, uh, you just told Jaden Gardner that he had an old man YMCA game. However, it's a compliment. Uh, 
Average over 16 points a game. Yeah. Uh, how impactful is he going to be for the Pirates this season, especially with 13 newcomers on that roster? Well, he was really in the lead for most of the year for uh, player, uh, excuse me, rookie of the year in the American Conference, and because he was just putting out monster numbers. He's a double-double machine. He does have that unorthodox game, is that he's an undersized post player, but he plays angles so well he can get out and run in transition. The system that Coach Dooley has for the Pirates fits his game like a glove. He's so physical. He's so aggressive, really relentless. Anywhere 10 feet in around the rim is an automatic bucket for Jaden Gardner. And, and if Seth Leday gets healthy, who's coming off a torn ACL, that tandem between Gardner and Seth Leday is going to be really dangerous because Leday's quickness is great. He has really an opportunity to pair with Gardner to form a tandem that will, that will be really kind of the tops in the conference. You can see his spin move. He's got great footwork ball control around the rim. That back to the basket player to compliment Jaden Gardner is going to be really good for the Pirates this year. All right, well, moving on, we're going to talk some UCF men's basketballs. We're now joined here on the set by UCF head coach Johnny Dawkins and senior guard Matt Milan. Thanks to both of you for stopping by. Coach, 10 newcomers on this year's roster. How different of a position is this group in, especially in the preseason, compared to that veteran group that you were coaching last season? Well, you know, we've almost had a complete roster turnover, so uh, it's a big difference for us. But, you know, our guys have been great. Uh, the guys that have been with me over the last several years, they know what our standards are. Uh, what to expect and they, I think they're doing a great job of working with the newcomers. I think you might. One thing that might go overlooked is you have, I think, the most underrated backcourt maybe in college basketball. We have grad transfer Dazon Ingram from Alabama, Matt Milan who's sitting next to me from William & Mary. I mean that tandem point guard shooting guard tandem has got to be a really fun group to coach. Even though it's new, it's got to be a really fun group to coach. You know, it has been. Uh, they both provide a lot of leadership. Uh, they both have been in the college game for a while, as, as you've mentioned. And the thing I've liked is watching them develop the chemistry. Uh, they're starting to really learn to play off each other, make each other better, and those are you know, good signs for us. Matt, in your first year stepping onto this team, what has been your first impression of the culture that has been established at UCF? Uh, just the culture of work, like working hard, uh, coming in every day, like getting early, staying late, you're getting your shots, what you're supposed to do. Uh, just working hard and playing defense, that's really the culture of UCF. Now, Matt, you're from Orlando. Why was it important to you to come back and play your final season at UCF? Uh, just what it represents for me, like my family, my friends, being from Oviedo 10 minutes down the road. So uh, all that is going together and then just the right opportunity and the right timing. You're going to have your own cheering section. you got enough guest tickets for this guy. He's going to have 1,000 people from Oviedo. Half the population of Oviedo is going to be in the stands for UCF. Yeah. Still trying to figure that out. <laughs> So you do have, we talked about a lot of new pieces, Coach. You had an opportunity to take a trip overseas and learn more about your team. What were some of those big takeaways that you learned about maybe some of the new players for UCF? Uh, one of the big takeaways was that, you know, they really do enjoy each other. You know, part of going on that, that type of trip, besides it being a cultural experience, is the ability to play those games. And, and we were playing, and the thing I watched our guys, and there weren't very many clicks. Guys really connected with each other on the court and off the court. And that's something that, that's rare, especially this day and age. So they really get along well, and I, I think they'll, that, that will, you know, contribute to us. You know, being very competitive. Matt, what was your favorite part of that trip? Uh, just all the tours and uh, seeing everything, and then uh, like new experience and food. Probably the food I really enjoyed. Favorite thing that you saw? You got to give us one. Oh man, uh, probably one of the bullfighting rings. They were, those were impressive. Pretty cool. Pretty How can cool. a trip like that, with so many new faces, help kind of bond and bring this group together? Coach mentioned that he didn't see a lot of clicks, but how did your team get closer in Spain? Uh, I mean, we took a lot of tours, and then we uh, we were together pretty much for 10 days straight, and then uh, with practice all summer. So uh, just taking the tours and just spending quality time with each other, getting to know each other, that's really how you get to know people better and build better chemistry. What, do you, what are some of the things that you guys are going to try to do offensively? I mean, you're the prolific three-point shooter. You've got some great distributors, distributors with Dazon and Caesar. I mean, what are some of the things you guys are going to try to do offensively this year? I uh, push the pace, and then, I mean, it starts on defense, and then when we get stops, we can run, and um, like some a lot of screens, flares, pin downs, things like that. But then, uh, like five out motion, like Colin will probably be playing on the perimeter and things like that. So, really spread out, uh, good pace. It's great for shooters, guys yeah, like you, yeah, yeah, things like that. So, really exciting. 
coach Caesar played and started in all 32 games as a redshirt freshman. With so much turnover and transition, how important is his experience going to be heading into this year? It's hugely important for us. Uh, he knows exactly what we want. Uh, he's been in every situation. You know, he's been in a locker room when it's been, you know, great. He's been in a locker room when it's been tough. And just his wisdom, you know, with the current players will be helpful for us. So we're excited to have him back. And he, he's, he's the player that I've coached the longest. He's been with me the longest. So. Uh, I'm excited, you know, for him to have this type of season. I think Colin Smith is the most underrated big man in the conference. And I say that because he had to play behind Taco Fall last year. So it's, you know, like, what's life like without Taco and the fact that Colin's going to have to be asked to do a little bit more on both ends of the court? Well, I think he's up to the challenge. You know, he, he's a very competitive young man. And as you mentioned, you know, he was playing, you know, behind Taco, Chad Brown, another big. So... And, and, you know, he wasn't one of our first three or four options. You know, I think now, you know, with his experience, you know, he moves up and, you know, in that area, he becomes one of our main options. And I think he's someone that will thrive in that type of situation. Having gotten to know him in recruiting and gotten to know him, you know, through the year, you know, he, he looks forward to that challenge. Last year, your team reached the NCAA tournament second round for the first time in program history and were inches away from heading to the Sweet 16. But even with a totally new roster, a lot of new faces, how can your team use some of that momentum and that confidence to carry them into this year, knowing what you had established last season? Well, it's about establishing a culture of, uh, you know, of winning, and, and we want to sustain excellence. And so these guys that are coming in, you know, they understand that they're coming here to continue to build on what was already accomplished. You know, we're not trying to take any steps back. We're trying to move forward. And it's important for these, these players that have arrived to, to understand from our current players the importance of how we have to work every day to get there. Now. We've talked a lot about some new face. We did talk about Caesar. We talked about yourself. We talked about Colin. But I'm actually kind of really excited to see, I mean, as a, as a senior, you have to really kind of mentor some of the freshmen. I really like Darren Green, another local Orlando product. You know, what does he bring to the team? Uh, I mean, kind of like myself, he brings a lot of shooting. He can shoot probably with the best of them, to be honest. Um, he's got good good length, good size and everything like that. So I think he has all the tools to be a really good player. Yeah, you get you got Matt. I mean, you got Frank Birch. You got Darren. You got some shooters on this squad, Coach. Yeah, we do. We have some guys that can make shots, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, we just have to make sure that, you know, we put them in the right positions and, and these guys play off each other. Matt, so far, how have you fit into the operation that Coach Dawkins is running at UCF? Uh, I think it's been a great transition. I mean, I, it helps being home and things like that. But then uh, I've always been a hard worker and things like that, getting in the gym and doing what I'm supposed to do. So uh, it's been pretty seamless that way. What is it specifically about your game that fits so well into the system at UCF? Uh, I think, well, I mean, he's done really well with shooters. He has a good track record, uh, guys like J.J. Redick, and then at UCF, Matt Williams, and uh, last year, guys like Aubrey. So um, that was really exciting for me, and uh, it's it's made it a lot really easy. All right, Matt, Coach, thanks so much for your time. Enjoy yourself here at Media Day, and looking forward to the season to come. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, man. Matt, we talk, or Mike, <laughs> you're Mike. We're both, we're both three-point shooters, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's all Classic right. mix-up. Uh, Mike, we talk about a lot of the newcomers on this UCF roster. Uh, so many exciting veterans, though, that were lost from last year, specifically B.J. Taylor and Taco Fall, just to name a couple of them. But how does Coach Dawkins, in your opinion, go about trying to maybe not replace those holes, but just kind of start to fill them? Well, you lose Aubrey Dawkins, and you lose your sixth man um, as well, and Chad Brown, who was kind of your, your energy bunny rabbit. Um, there, there's going to be a different system almost completely that you want to get out and run and play fast though the difference is with this team you've got a lot of depth coach Dawkins has a lot of depth with this team I think he's still trying to figure out the chemistry but life without taco fall will be interesting to figure out because it's not always about the stat sheet you know when it came to taco fall and what he did offenses had to plan around him specifically when he was in the game and when he was out of the game he almost had two different scatter reports so what kind of speed does UCF play with? I do think, though, with Dazon Ingram, the grad transfer from Alabama, Matt Milan, who was a top 10 three-point shooter in the country last year at William & Mary, shot over 40% from three, you've got plenty of pieces to really make another postseason run. 
chemistry will be the big issue. It won't be depth, it will be chemistry and how they really kind of formulate on the defensive end. Yes, will certainly be interesting to see the identity of this UCF team in the season to come. All right, let's move on and talk about UConn. The Huskies picked to finish sixth in the preseason poll. Head coach Dan Hurley heading into his second season, but he returns junior guard Alteri Gilbert, who earlier today was named to the preseason all-conference second team. And Mike had a chance to catch up with Alteri right here last night. Art Gilbert, so a lot of changes for UConn coming down the pipe, but the more important thing is you have the bulk of your starting lineup back, right? I mean, why is that so important leading into the summer, coming into this year? Because obviously expectations are high. Right. Um, I think it's a great it's, it's a great opportunity for us. Um, we know to, we know what to expect. Um, you know, uh, with her, with Coach Ben, this being his second year, uh, we could bring the new guys along, get everybody acclimated to what we want to do. So you've had to talk about it basically, you know, for the last couple of years about this is really the first chunk of time where you've been really healthy. And so nobody's really kind of seen your game yet. I mean, some of us know watching you from high school, but now you got an opportunity to really kind of show out. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, like you said, it's my first time, uh, my first summer actually, uh, you know, being able to work and actually develop and, uh, you know, compete in the summer. So it was great for me. Um, you know, I, I developed uh, and grew mentally and physically, um, you know, so I'm excited. So give me a little inside scoop. Some of the new guys coming on the pipe for you guys, like James. Or who else is really kind of showing out for you guys in practice? Uh, James, definitely. Um, McCook, definitely. And Jalen is, is a great athlete as well. So, um, you know, we're excited for those guys. Um, young guys, really energetic ready. They play above the rim, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, Cook's going to help. Huskies don't sleep on them this season. He really is that kind of player that when he is healthy, he is one of the fastest and most dynamic players in all of college basketball. We just haven't seen it yet. Really, for the last two years, he's been banged up a string of bad luck. But he's so dynamic in the uh, in the full court. He's incredible off the ball screen. He's able to get into the lane, into the teeth of the defense, and really make a lot of plays for UConn because that's what Coach Hurley wants. He wants players to play aggressive, to get out and run. They want 94 feet, 40 minutes, get up in your face, and Gilbert is the perfect leader for that style of play. The good news for Altari Gilbert, it was his first summer without experiencing an injury. So hoping Altari can stay healthy for UConn uh, in the year to come. Moving on, talking about Christian Vital, the senior guard. He played in all 33 ga games last year, starting 29 of those, and he finished as the team's second leading scorer. What are you expecting to see from Christian Vital this season? Well, he's a really good three-point shooter. We know that uh, when he can get out of his comfort zone and maybe attack a little bit more, he becomes one of the better really kind of scorers in the American Conference. Defensively, though, that's the big key. Coach Hurley is all about defense. You can't have any mental errors. You can't come with 50% effort on the defensive end. And I think Christian Vital, if he accepts that on both ends of the floor, he's the type of player that can be a first team all conference type talent. But can he put it together on both ends of the floor and play within Coach Hurley's style of play? That's a big key. Forward Josh Carlton also returns after sharing the league's most improved player honor last season in the American. And Mike, this is the tallest player on UConn's roster standing at 6 foot 11. Well, Josh Carlton didn't go home this summer and he really got after it in the weight room. The staff has been raving about how physically ready he is to play more so this year than he was last year. Remember, didn't go home for the summer, stayed in the weight room, got shots up, worked on his conditioning. He needs to play at least 28 minutes a game for UConn to really be pushing towards the upper echelon of the conference. All right, we now welcome in NBC Sports College Hoops writer Rob Douster. Rob, thanks for stopping by to talk some American hoops this morning. Obviously, one of the big storylines people across the media are tracking on here today is Memphis. Why is that one of the most interesting stories across the country in college basketball this season? I think it, first of all, starts with the fact that Penny Hardaway's there, and I think Penny's going to draw attention anywhere he goes. I mean, he's Penny Hardaway, right? Um, and then you throw in the fact that they're able to get these recruiting classes and these players coming in, the James Wiseman, the Precious Tua, and all of a sudden there's excitement and there's hype. And, and you know, I think another part of it is just it's Memphis basketball. And I just think it's good for the sport when that program and those fans are engaged and that program is good. Uh, so I think that that's part of it as well. Well, you're pretty tuned in to the recruiting trail as well. And I've had an opportunity to go to a few events. I mean, when he walks in the gym, 
I mean, it's a big deal. People I notice. mean, there, there's no. I mean, it's more than. It's almost like coaches are fearful when he walks in because he's coming after players. Yeah, and he's got his own shoes on. He's wearing Louis Vuitton backpacks. Like it, 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 it's a statement when Penny Hardaway walks in the gym. And you know, Mike Miller's there too. And let's not gloss over that fact as well. He certainly helps on the recruiting trail. I would like to call you crazy quickly because you picked <laughs> Cincinnati to finish fifth. Because it was a great write-up in NBC Sports. You had a great breakdown, but you picked Cincinnati fifth. Please explain yourself. So, my concern. I don't even know if concern is the right word, but my worry is that Jerron Cumberland is dealing with his foot issue, and John Brandon said the other day that he hasn't practiced yet. Uh, and my, it's not just whether or not he's healthy, I think, is the issue. You, know, you got a new coach coming in, you got new players coming in. I think they bring five guys back off of last season's team. So if we know that, that Jerron Cumberland is getting back into practice next week and is going to get a couple weeks in learning the system, learning what uh, Coach Brandon wants him to do offensively, where he's supposed to rotate defensively, I think it's a different story, but until he gets back and until we see him playing and practicing, it's just, it's a concern for me. Jerron Cumberland's really, really good. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> One of the exciting additions to the American the last couple of seasons has been Wichita State. The Shockers got off to a slow start last year, but we really saw them come alive towards the end of the season. How do you expect Greg Marshall's group to build off of that from last year? I think they're going to be really, really good. You know, I, I think that Greg Marshall's track record speaks for itself. And I think the evidence of that is the fact that they started, I believe it was one and six in the American last year. They won nine of their last 11, 14 of their last 18, and then they went on the road and beat Furman, Clemson, and Indiana in the NIT. And I think that says all you need to know. They got guys coming back. Losing Teddy Allen hurts because I think he kind of gives them, he was going to replace that scoring pop that, that Marcus McDuffie uh, with his graduation that they lose. But um, I mean, Dexter Dennis is a really good player. Jaime Eshenike, I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Um, he's back. I think he's going to take a step forward this year. And, and basically, at this point, you just bet on Greg Marshall. Right? You bet on Greg Marshall, you bet on Kelvin Sampson, and, and just call it a day. No doubt. And I love the fact, the one thing I will agree with is I'm all in on the Bulls this year. Mm -hmm. I think what, I, mean, I think they're we're basically two years ahead of where I think Coach Gregory yep. wanted them to be. But they're so big, so physical, and they essentially have an entire team back that played Houston maybe just about the best thing, but it could last year, and they won the CBI. Yeah, and I think that that helps. And I know it's just the CBI and people are going to laugh at that, but that's another, what, three, four weeks worth of practices? That's right. That's a chance to experience how to play in a tournament setting. Um, and, and I think all of that stuff just helps bring people together. And, again, you're bringing everybody back, right? And they're young, too. The Quincy Redu, David Collins, that might be – is that the best backcourt in it the American? It might be the most under, underappreciated backcourt mm -hmm. in the country. I mean, Rideau, uh, he led the American in steals and assists last season. I mean, what other point guard in the country yeah. actually does that? That's it's what impressive. you want out of a point guard, That's right? exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike's clearly all in on USF <laughs> this year, but, Rob, do you think they're a serious contender for the conference title? I think that they're in the mix. I think that it's going to come down to, personally, I think it's going to be Houston and Memphis. And, and they're, I think that shows up in the preseason poll. Uh, but, I mean, they're, they're going to be right there. I have them number four. And if you're number four in a preseason conference where it's as balanced as this is, and, I mean, sure, things break their way. Get a couple of road wins. Yeah, I got uh, Memphis, Houston, Cincinnati, Wichita State as pretty much locked for the conference turn. excuse me, the NCAA tournament. And I think USF is that other team that's going to be that strong bubble team. Who else do you like maybe that might be a strong bubble consideration? I think Temple can kind of sneak their way in there. I think they bring the most back that, uh, that, that is in South Florida. I think that UConn has a chance. I just, you know, Danny Hurley's got a bunch of really good guards. And when you have good athletic guards playing in Danny Hurley's system, I think that that is, is a good thing for you. James, James Booknight mm -hmm. could be a pro. Mm -hmm. Rob, earlier you mentioned the excitement surrounding Memphis and that basketball is a little bit more fun when Memphis is good. Uh, same could be said for Houston and what Kelvin Sampson has done for that program. Um, how relevant is Houston when it comes to the national landscape, especially with the consistency that they've been able to establish over these last few years? I think that they're very relevant. You know, they were, what, a three seed last year? Um, and I think Kelvin, you know, you, he had the interest from Arkansas during this offseason. I think that really tells you all you need to know about what he is uh, as a basketball coach. And, um, you know, I think this is going to be another year where they take a step forward. Dejan Giroux is a guy I think is going to be maybe the breakout star uh, of the conference. I'm just really excited to see. You know, Houston, after 2018, they lost Rob Gray, and we were concerned about what they were going to end up being and how they replaced him. And all of a sudden, Corey Davis ends up being one of the best players in the league. And Armani Brooks is good enough to turn pro with a year of eligibility left. So I think Dejan Zerow is going to be the guy that takes a step this and season. And even before that, how would you replace Damian Dotson and Devin exactly. Davis? And then Rob Gray ran crazy. Mm -hmm. And then they replace that. It's, it's the Kelvin Sampson yeah, effect. It's almost like he's, he's good at his job. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the coaches have picked Memphis and Houston. 
to win this league, but if you had to pick one, who's your preseason prediction? I think I would probably lean towards Houston just because of the experience factor, but if you were going to tell me that Memphis wins the league, I'm probably not going to argue too hard. All right, Rob, thank you so much for your time and for your coverage. Looking forward to a great year ahead. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> All right, we are now joined here on the set by Cincinnati head coach John Brannon. We'll be joined here momentarily by senior guard Jaron Cumberland. Coach, first of all, welcome to the American Conference. Uh, gearing up for your first season at Cincinnati, how much opportunity do you see taking over this program? Well, tremendous. You know, first of all, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, a tremendous opportunity to take over one of the most storied programs in college basketball with not only uh, traditional success but recent success. And uh, you know, in a power conference like the American, we're excited to get started. Coach, you had an opportunity to call one of your games in Northern Kentucky last year, and I just fell in love with your offensive system. You know, it was something that I wanted to play in because of the way you guys spread and move the ball, the unselfishness. Will we see some of that kind of action with, with the Cincinnati basketball? You will. You will. We're trying to figure that out right now. We're learning to play at the pace we need to play at and the speed that we need to play at in order for that system to, to matriculate to what you saw. And we certainly got the talent for it, and it's just getting everybody understanding how fast we need to play and the pace we need to play at, but also understanding that you, know, you win championships, which is what we've done in Northern Kentucky and the Cincinnati team's done through defense. We now have senior guard Jaron Cumberland joining us, named the preseason player of the year earlier this morning. Now, Jaron, I know you've been battling a foot injury this offseason. How are you feeling heading into the season as it quickly approaches? Uh, I'm feeling good. Uh, coach... Um, coach Brandon and the training staff, Bob Manzine, and our strength coach, Mike Rayfield, they really put a plan and uh, got me uh, feeling healthy for the practices now and uh, just getting in shape. So you had an opportunity to kind of test the NBA waters a little bit. Can you kind of talk about that experience and, and what you learned from that process? Uh, it was a very neat experience um, going through the progress. Uh, it was really, it was fun but it was also intense at the same time. Uh, it was something, I learned a lot from it. What was the, what, what, what do you, when you say it was intense, what, is that, uh, what does that mean? Uh, the workouts and everything, just going through it, it was something I never experienced before. So it was something that I can be ready for next year. Jaron, kind of a neat experience. Your cousin Javen joins the team this year, both playing in your final season. How special do you expect that experience to be getting to play together kind of one last time here in college? That's going to be really fun, playing with my cousin for one more for my last year. Uh, just having, just having, just knowing that I got him for one more year and knowing that I used to play with him when I was younger. It's going to be really fun. So transferring, sorry, Mike. So transferring from Oakland, players that haven't seen your cousin Javen play, he made over 100 threes at Oakland. What can he add to this team immediately this season? A lot of knockdown threes. <laughs> uh, we got, we got uh, Coach, he brought a lot of good players in. And uh, we got Chris McNeil, grad transfer, sen uh, uh, senior guard. He's going to be really good for us. So, Coach, uh, you're already coming over, taking over a historic program in Cincinnati basketball, you know, been in the tournament the last seven years. But you have an opportunity to walk into a situation and coach this guy over here. What's it been like coaching Jerry? Well, he's one of the most unselfish players I've ever been around. I mean, he make, you know, as a coach, you talk about make the right decision and live with the result. He makes the right decision on every play. Uh, he can score the ball, but he does it efficiently. Uh, He's got a tremendous IQ and feel for the game and really understands how to play with other people. And I think the biggest compliment you can give a player is, can you make the game easier for those around you? And there are very few players that can do that. Jaron has the capability of making the game easier for those around him. Jaron, one of the keys on this year's roster, but so is junior guard Keith Williams, who played in 35 games with 32 starts last season. How much are you expecting Keith to contribute to your lineup this Keith's season? Keith's a guy who's a perfect fit for our style of play. And, you know, the challenge that I've given Jaron, Keith, and Trey is, you know, their ability to be completely committed in the deep end into how we're going to play. Because the talent level of those three guys is off the charts. And if they do that and have a complete understanding of what we're doing, then we'll be the team that we're supposed to be. And Keith's got an opportunity to do that. We just got, He's just got to find more consistency. He's shooting the ball at a high level. Just got to find more consistency each and every day. I usually love calling certain guys glue guys because it's a little bit cliche and everything. But Trey Scott's kind of that one guy that when he's playing at a high level, can really amplify your offense on a game-to-game -game basis. No question. Uh, you know, Trey's a guy that can impact us in a, not only in a leadership role, which he has on our team, but also his ability. You know, he's been known as an energy guy his whole career. That's got to continue. You either give energy or you take energy. He's also a guy that can knock down the perimeter jump shot now. He's more offensive. I think he's got more offensive firepower. And he's a guy who can impact the game in, like I said, a multitude of ways, not just uh, specifically in one area. 
Coach, how about Trevor Moore? What does he add to this year's roster? Uh, personality, <laughs> um, shot making ability. Um, he's an energy provider. He's a guy that you know gets excited about practice each and every day. He's banged up right now, so. He's, uh, he's been out for a little while. We expect him back here when the season starts. Could you elaborate a little bit because on um, your idea of pace when it comes to the game uh, in terms of uh, some people will say, well, the team's playing with great pace, but nobody really knows what that means. Yeah. But you, that's a really big proponent of how you orchestrate a new system. It is. So uh, it's a great question. So offensively, it's not quick shots. It's pace into your offense. It's, it's getting the ball across half court and getting your offense within six or seven seconds and then playing through the, a non-set defense. Defensively, it's slowing teams down, pressing them, trying to make them uh, go deeper into the shot clock. I think your elite teams have pace offensively, but also control tempo defensively. If you're able to marry the two, you got a chance to be an elite team. Jaron, you've been a part of a team each season that's had the opportunity to go to the NCAA tournament. What is kind of like that one tangible thing that each team has had that's helped get you there? Uh, toughness. That's one thing that we always had, toughness. Um, really, I mean, it starts on defense. And Coach, Coach Brandon, he coming here. That's one thing he's really been on us about defense. So that's always one thing you know we're going to bring. After playing for Coach Cronin for three seasons and now Coach Brandon here, how has this transition been for you heading into your senior season? That's a um, trick question, you know. He's sitting right here, <laughs> man. That's nice. a trick question. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a different it's been different, but um, me and Coach, we we got a, a relationship now that we're understanding what we want and. Uh, both of both us, we just want to win. So I know if we have a great relationship, it's going to be great for just the team. you got some great freshmen coming in, you know, and you had to, you had to recruit really quickly. I mean, can you talk about some of the guys that you brought in this year? Yeah, you know, I think the, those guys have a chance to impact our program this year and for many years to come. You know, uh, Zach Harvey's a really talented young man from Kansas who's uh, been injured and just not getting back. He had reconstructive angle surgery in January, so he's now just getting back full speed. Uh, Micah Adams Woods is a really talented guard out of New York who can provide a lot for us, I think, in time as well as this season. And Jeremiah Davenport, who's injured right now, won't be back till December, is a guy that I expect a lot out of. Coach, lastly, we've become accustomed to a certain style of play at Cincinnati over the years. One word to describe your style. Aggressive. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to the season. Best of luck to both of you. Thanks for having us, Coach. We've got a lot to get to here in Philadelphia. We are just getting started at American Men's Basketball Media Day, the beautiful sights of this great city. Mike, how great of a basketball city is Philadelphia? Oh, well, high school basketball in Philadelphia is legendary. I mean, some of the great players in high school basketball history have come out of Philadelphia. It's always, always a great time to be in the city of brotherly love when it comes to hoops. <laughs> Well, speaking of Cincinnati, we just had first-year head coach Don Brandon join us, as well as the preseason player of the year in Darren Cumberland. So naturally, we welcome in Justin Williams, who is the staff writer at The Athletic covering Cincinnati. Justin, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, something that we've been tracking on recently, and Jaron just mentioned it, but he's the Americans' preseason player of the year, and he's battling an injury uh, with his foot here in the offseason. What do you kind of know up to this point about what he's been facing? Uh, you know, it's kind of something that lingered. Uh, I don't think there's too much concern. I just talked to him a little bit before he got up here, and he said he's feeling good. I know the plan was to have him ready for the season. And with a guy like that, I, you know, when you win player of the year last year, I think there's not too many concerns. Obviously, there's a new system, um, and there's a lot involved with that, and I know Brandon wants to get him on the floor as much as possible in terms of install. Uh, but I think the biggest thing for them was just making sure he's, he's healthy and ready to go, and he seems on track for, for that for the start of the season. So I always love Coach Brandon's Northern Kentucky teams. I thought he, I th always thought he was a phenomenal coach, you know, a big X's and O's guy. But how has the community kind of embraced this hire? Because you're plugged into the Cincinnati community. You know, Coach Brandon, his style of play, it'll be aggressive, but it'll be a little different than the McCronin days. Yeah, and I, I think it was really interesting to hire in general just because because he is a local guy, and that's an important thing in Cincinnati. It's, it's a really that provincial huge, town. Yeah. yeah, and so he wasn't necessarily tied to the past in any way, but he still had kind of the local recognition, and I think that gave him a really unique perspective and a 
potential as a coach at Cincinnati. And so I think in that way, the community's really rallied around him, just knowing the, the connections and the work that he's put in locally. Um, but yeah, in terms of style of play, it's going to be a lot different. Everyone talks about the pace, and that's the biggest thing with him. I, I think what fans will not be expecting is on defense is where I think they're going to see it a lot more. You know, offense, they're going to be moving quicker, score more points, shooting more. Uh, but defense, it's a lot of up-tempo pressure. And, uh, you know, defense has always been the calling card for UC under Cronin, but it was kind of packing it in, slowing teams down. I think on defense is where fans will really see a big difference. Yeah, games in the 80s versus games in the 60s, That's right? right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Justin, Cincinnati, one of six teams to make nine straight NCAA appearances. What sort of pressure does that put on a first-year head coach in John Brandon to sustain that level of excellence when it comes to postseason expectations? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of pressure. And when you have the player of the year coming back and three starters, you know, there's some expectations there. Uh, I do think in terms of long term, he has a plan. He has a, a system he wants to install. He wants to get his, his players in there, and that'll take a little bit of time. But it's clear talking to him uh, and, and the staff to start the season, there's an understanding of, of what they have coming back. And it's important to them to for guys like Jaron and Trey Scott and Keith Williams and Trevor Moore to make sure that they still have the experience that they deserve and, and that they kind of go out on a high note, especially for, for Jaron and Trey being seniors. And so they're looking towards the future, but I think they understand the amount of talent they have coming back and the potential they have to continue that streak of NCAA tournaments. Memphis and Houston obviously tied to pick to win the conference. Cincinnati clearly plenty of talent to compete for that top spot. Who's maybe is that? You follow this conference pretty closely. Who's maybe that dark horse team that might have a chance to really get that number one spot by the end of the season? I don't know if they're a dark horse. Wichita State, I think, was maybe a little bit down last year. I think Greg Marshall's a really good coach, so I think they're going to be a lot better this season and, and remind people of what they were even just two years ago. It's easy to forget with being down last year and all the hype around Memphis, which is deserved, that, that Wichita's a really strong team. And then the other one is just the strides that USF has already made under Brian Gregory, I, I think, is pretty impressive. And so I think that's a team that you're going to see continue to improve. I think they were ninth in the preseason poll. I was, I was surprised by that. I, I would have been a little bit higher on on them uh, and so I think that would be a team maybe a little bit lower down the rankings that's worth keeping an eye on. Justin when the preseason poll was announced earlier this morning what was your first impression right when you saw it? Uh, I was not surprised uh, necessarily to see UC third which is kind of what I was first looking at as the UC beat writer. Uh, I, I think the Houston Memphis tie was interesting it was the first time there's been a tie in, in the American. There's been so much hype and talk about Memphis uh, as a potential NCAA championship team and Final Four team. And to see that there's still a lot of respect within the conference for what Houston and, and Kelvin Sampson has done. And even UC with a new coach and a lot of turnover on the roster. Uh, I think that's a credit to the, the systems, the players, and the coaches, you know, especially what Kelvin Sampson has done at Houston. Cincinnati loves their basketball. And looking at these matchups that come throughout conference play, what are some of the most exciting matchups? Maybe not necessarily natural rivalries, but some that fans have really become excited and accustomed to seeing, especially on campus in a beautiful brand new Fifth Third Arena. Uh, people are going to always be excited when, when Memphis is coming, regardless of, you know, the top recruiting class this season. Uh, there's a lot of history there with UC playing against Memphis uh, when back in the old Missouri Conference, and uh, I think Penny has struggled. He's talked about how he struggled playing against, you know, UC as a player and now even as a coach, so I, there's a little bit of a, a rivalry there. And with Wiseman and uh, the recruiting class that they have, I think that's going to be a, a big one to, to watch this season. And, you know, I... UConn. I don't know if we're, how much we're talking about UConn because I know they're going to the Big East, but uh, that's been a, a rivalry for a while, and so I think people will be excited to see the last conference season of, of those teams going against each other. Just like everybody else, my pick for Player of the Year was Jaron, but is there another guy, maybe outside of James Wiseman, that maybe could compete for that Player of the Year conversation this season? Uh, I think Rideau um, from, from USF, I, th I think that's uh, an interesting possibility. Just a guy who's maybe going a little bit under the radar. Um, and then Rose at Temple, uh, you know, Quentin Rose, he was a, they had a really good, strong team last season. Uh, and I think they have a, a good returning class. I think McKee's going to do some interesting things there. Uh, so I think those would be two maybe under the radar guys. Because, yeah, Wiseman and, and Jaron are probably going to be the, the two guys that everyone's mentioned. Good picks, man. <laughs> Justin knows his stuff. We're clearly talking basketball today, but one quick question, Justin, before you go, covering Cincinnati to the capacity that you do, uh, quick hop over to football. Sure. Is the conference championship headed to Cincinnati this year? What is going on in the American? Uh, so 
the, the first six games for UC were, were the tough ones, and for them to come out of it five and one, I, I think there's a lot of excitement. Uh, you know, the, the rest of the slate, they finish with Temple and, and Memphis, and it's going to be important for Luke Fickle and that team to not look past the, the four games they had before that. But I know for a lot of the fans, that's what they're looking at because those last two games, I think, will decide whether UC's playing in the tournament or in the championship and if maybe <laughs> Nippert Stadium gets to host that. So there's certainly a lot of excitement. People are excited about Brandon in basketball, but uh, it's, it's a good time for football. <laughs> Cincinnati right a lot now, going so. on at Cincinnati and uh, we'll have to wait to see what happens down the stretch. Appreciate your time, Justin. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Uh, Cincinnati, a lot of the talk in football and in basketball, but uh, that's also common at SMU, Mike. The football team having a pretty good season over there, but we're here to talk basketball today. So SMU picked to finish eighth in this preseason poll. Head coach Tim Jankovic enters his fourth season and he's heavily going to rely on forward Ethan Chargois. And Isaiah, Mike, Isaiah Mike, rather, as the Mustangs welcome newcomers to their roster. Mike had a chance to catch up with Isaiah last night right here in Philadelphia. All right, so Isaiah, big season coming up for the Mustangs. You know, you've got a lot of new faces. And that's the biggest thing that people want to know. Who is this Mustang team? So can you talk about some of the new guys that have come on campus at SMU? Well, we have a lot of talented guys that have come into this team. Uh, our freshmen are hungry and ready to learn. All, all, all our guys are giving their all in practices. You know, it's, it's a lot to pick up, uh, all the new guys, but we're, we're going to be in good hands. So you and Ethan were a beast on the front court last year. And looking into this year, I always like to ask players during the summer, like, what's one or two things that you worked on your game specifically that you want to show the nation this year? Uh, definitely my ball handling ability. Uh, I've still been in the gym shooting a whole bunch of shots, trying to work on my consistency. Uh, but other than that, man, the, my left hand, ball handling, and just getting as much shots up as I can. Left hand is key, right, yeah. So I love your offense. You know, it's very pass-oriented, players that can dribble, pass, shoot. You know, that's Coach Jankovic's offense. Are we going to see that same type of culture in terms of offensive fluidity for you guys? Definitely. One thing we, very, we focus uh, on a lot during these practices is ball movement. That's the, the number one thing. Coach hates ball stoppers. We, that's the, he emphasizes moving the ball, driving and driving and kicking, driving and kicking, trying to get uh, open shot for your teammates. So you'll, you'll definitely see a lot more of that this year. No ball stoppers for the Mustangs. Isaiah Mike has an opportunity to be really good this season. He's ultra talented. He was a transfer from Duquesne. Most of the issues last year for SMU were on the defensive end where their matchup zone was really kind of hurt on the glass and didn't force any turnovers. But that tandem between the six foot eight Isaiah Mike, who just heard that interview, and Farron Hunt offers plenty of length and defensive upside. And I think they'll make a lot more plays on the defensive end to really push the Mustangs out on, on offense. Mike, one of the keys returning for this SMU roster, but so is junior forward Ethan Chargois. He played in every game last year, started all except for senior day. How important is he going to be to what Tim Jankovic tries to implement this season? Well, he's the perfect kind of front court player for SMU in that he's not one dimensional. He can step out, shoot the three. He can be a back to the basket player. He's actually a really underrated passer. He's got great ball skills around the rim. He's going to need a big year, not talking just offensively because I think he's a guy who can average 15 a game. He needs to be a double-double machine. SMU did not rebound the ball very well at all last season. But the good thing is, though, Haley, is this is the first year since Coach Jankovic has come, taken over the reins at SMU that he has all of his scholarships, all the NCAA sanctions are lifted, and you've got a full roster. How about Farron Hunt, the six foot eight sophomore forward, played in every game last year, starting eight of those, averaged over seven points and six rebounds a game. Needs a really big year because essentially the entirety of SMU's backcourt is gone. They don't have a single point guard on this roster. They need oh, front not. court attributions yeah. on the offensive end. They have to score around the rim in order for them to be successful. All right, well, we are moving on. We are going to talk Wichita State as we're now joined here by head coach Greg Marshall and sophomore guard Dexter Dennis. Thanks to both of you for taking some time. Coach, you returned nine letter winners from last year, three of those being starters. How does that position this team to build off of last year's momentum? Uh, well, I think our guys have, um, the returners especially, uh, enjoyed some success in the, down the stretch last year. Uh, they, they felt the, the difference from last year early when we, we couldn't make a basket and win a game to going on the road and beating some really good teams in the NIT, making Madison Square Garden. Now I think our guys 
understand how it feels to win and, and, and what, what that can do for a program and you, you individually. Our freshmen are very dynamic. They, they've uh, come in. They've really picked things up quickly. Uh, they're, they're precocious. They really do a great job of uh, working hard every day. And I think they're going to blend very well with these returners. And we have a chance to have a special team. It kind of felt like uh, it, that the freshmen last year didn't necessarily understand the type of how hard you needed them to play. Thank you very they much. <laughs> it, but they, you, you figured it out about halfway through the season, you know. Right. Uh, and this this year in practice, I've got to assume that competition has been fantastic because they know there's so much talent on this squad. If you let up for just a second, your spot's getting picked. You are spot on because I said to our guys last year, and Dexter will laugh, but I, many times I said if I could grant one wish and not – I don't, I'm not talking about a Disney movie where I grant that every shot that we take goes in so we win every game, but realistically, if I could grant one wish, I had a magic wand, it would be to make you guys understand exactly how hard you must compete at this level of college basketball to have any chance of winning. And I didn't have that magic wand, and as much as I tried, it took us to have losing a few games and, and taking our lumps before it finally caught on. And Traditionally, we've won with defense and rebounding, and we weren't even good at that for, for a good period of the year last year. And finally, we started to defend and rebound. We never shot the ball at a great clip, but we were still able to win because we were hardened with that defense and rebounding. So we ultimately figured it out. Dexter, you hear Coach talk about last year's freshmen. Um, you were part of that group. When you look back to last year, what was your biggest learning moment and takeaway that's going to help push you into this season? Uh, I think the main thing is just like you said, the, the effort standpoint, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was really hard for us early on because, you know, we were just freshmen. We were there. We didn't know what to do. We were just trying to make a name for ourselves. And, you know, when most freshmen come in, they think they just have to score and, you know, things like that. And we learned it was just more about, like, defense and rebounding, too. So I feel like the learning that um, last year would kind of help me this year, too, early on. At what point last season did your team feel it click? Um... I'd probably say after we were one and six, I'd say one and six in conference. It kind of was like I think after the USF game, maybe, maybe after the USF game. And I don't know after that last film session we had and those last couple hard breaks, I think it just everybody was like, all right, let's, let's just give it everything we got right now at this point. I imagine every practice is a hard practice with Coach Marshall and yeah. uh, every single. But <laughs> Coach, you know, you never, you never want to look in the rearview mirror and, and you lose just an incredible, not just player, but an ambassador for your program in McDuffie. Is there a guy, maybe Trey Wade, that kind of feels that versatility from a switching man-to-man, -man, can, can guard multiple positions kind of get player? Yeah, Trey Wade has really uh, shown, especially in the last handful of practices, that he's going to be a core guy, if not a starter. Uh, he's going to really help us. He's a, he's a good basketball player. He does everything well. He's not spectacular in any phase, but he does everything well. So he has really very few weaknesses, and he's a wonderful kid to coach. That's the one thing I'm blessed with. I've got 16 guys on my team, and they're all tremendous people. They are working extremely hard. They're very coachable. They are great people on and off the court. And they make it a lot of fun to come to work every day. So uh, that has always been a success for us because our play, our program has been built on player development. Coach, you mentioned the freshmen last year and how they've grown. But you look at the lone senior on this year's roster and Hamey Echenique, the senior center. What are you expecting from him this season? How important is he going to be? Well, he's had a little foot problem. so uh, that, And he had a foot problem last year on a different foot. But this year's not as bad. If he's healthy, he can be a dominant force. Uh, the kid has, I think he has borderline NBA skill. He can shoot the three at 6'11". Uh, he needs to get a little tougher, a little nastier on the court. He's such a nice young man, but he has great footwork, can put the ball in the deck a little bit, can move, block shots, and rebound above the rim. So. Uh, he keeps getting better. If he can just stay healthy, I look for him to have a, a tremendous season from a standpoint of output points, rebounds, block shots, and whatnot. What about Eric Stevenson for you guys? Eric Stevenson, as well as Jamarius Burton, mm -hmm. have changed their bodies. Both of them were a little too big last year. Maybe they got in the weight room a little too much, they, and they weren't great defensively. Uh, Eric was picked on by teams in the in the league. Uh, they they kind of isolated him anytime he was on the court. 
This year, he's so much quicker. He's moving his feet so much better. He and Jamarius have lost 10, 12, 15 pounds. They've increased their speed, their, uh, their ability to get off the floor, as well as their stamina and strength. So I I'm very excited about Eric and Jamarius for what they can do as a sophomore. Coach, Asborn McGuard, he became kind of a fan favorite last year, particularly after uh, learning that his name stood for God's Bear. But he was kind of one of those players that was certainly a presence on the floor for you. Uh, second on the team last year with 27 blocks. How has he, how has he grown rather since last season? The Great Dane. Uh, he has, um, you know, he's another guy. He's the nicest guy in the world, the most gentle. He's a gentle giant. And I think he was told as a youngster to not hurt other kids on the playground because he was so much bigger. But now, when he gets between those lines, he's starting to get a little bit of an edge. He's tried to dunk on a few guys the last couple of days in practice, and he really did come on. And, and, and uh, honestly, midway through his sophomore year, I just didn't know if his pro, his career would ever launch, but it did. And it, ironically, it was against um, UCF, and we needed him to lean on Taco Fall. We beat that team. Um, which kind of got us going really yeah. and he was really good in that game because of his size and then you know the coach wasn't very smart I should have been playing him more because he started coming on and he and um, Ichinike became like a two-headed monster at the five spot and we were rotating him keeping him fresh and they were setting a lot of ball screens and running the court and kind of wearing down the other team's five men so we're blessed with four five men that can really play with Isaiah Poor Bear Chandler as well as Morris Yadeze. You know, I really enjoyed watching you play last season, Dexter. You know, we, we saw flashes. It's just some incredible talent. But what are some of the things you worked on this summer, just personally for you, you know, to kind of take your game to the next level? Uh, you mean some things I'm currently still working on. There you go. Uh, is that the best answer? <laughs> Maybe you bet is it. That's, that's, you know, that's answer. a Greg Marshall player right exactly. there. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but mainly it's just ball handling the pass with me. Um, I'm blessed to have a uh, coaching staff and teammates that are just – constantly know I'm trying to work on it every day and they're they're hounding me every day so I think uh, it's just mainly that being able to create for myself and other teammates as well so Dexter when you look at the American Conference and all the different trips that you've gotten to take there's some pretty hostile road environments but in your first season playing at Wichita State what was your initial takeaway from what the Wichita fan base brings to your home games Man, it was, it was crazy. I think um, the first game we played, I think it was exhibition against um, Catawba or something like that. And uh, Mark told us, he was like, you know, this place is going to sell out tonight. And I'm like, you know, whatever. It's Division two team we're playing. It's probably not going to be any people here. And we walk out, and it's like 10,000 people. And I'm like, man, I, I don't even know what to do anymore. I can't even talk. <laughs> it's hard to catch the ball. I'm like, man, I'm so nervous. But after that, I kind of got used to it and stuff. But it's fun, man. Our fans, they, they love us, and they're loyal. And I think they kind of helped us a lot last year. Honestly. Coach, this is nothing new to you. You're used to that Wichita fan base showing up in full force. But for a freshman like Dexter, what do you do to mentally prepare them for that moment so that they're not overwhelmed by that situation? You know, I wish I could bring uh, – people off the streets to watch practice and we could fill up Coke Arena for practice and that maybe would help and we could honestly do that we could fill Coke Arena if I asked him to show up on any given day but uh, I've, I'm blessed 12 years in a row I've yet to coach a game that wasn't sold out in Coke Arena our fans are some of the best in the world and um, they really supported this young group last year and helped me raise them it was very difficult at times it was dire straits uh, early on but man they never abandoned us they kept their faith and ultimately help that young group finish the way they did. Well, good for, oh, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, tough non-conference schedule. Just wanted to hear about your, your non-conference schedule philosophy. This well, year. We're, we're, it's almost like we're back in the Valley when we had yeah. to do that to try to make an NCAA at-large bid, which we did many times. Don't have to do that in the American, but we're still scheduling like that. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Ole Miss, South Carolina, VCU, possibly West Virginia, just to name a few in the non-conference. But that's what I've always wanted to do. I want to play the best. I want these guys to be hardened when it gets to the conference season. And uh, last year, it was a mistake because we scheduled over our heads with our inexperience and, and youth. But this year, it should be some exciting 
pre-conference games, matchups, uh, great travel. We're going to go to Cancun this year. We'll be back in the, the battle for Atlantis next year, and, uh, and we're going to take a foreign tour this coming season to this coming summer to Denmark, take the big Dane home, and we're going to go to uh, Barcelona as well. Coach, lastly, speaking of travel, what I was going to mention before was your fan base has the pretty unique opportunity this year to be within driving distance of the conference tournament in Fort Worth. How much is your program looking forward to being there in Texas? Okay. Don't be surprised if three to 5,000 Shocker fans show up in Fort Worth. When we used to have the Valley Tournament in St. Louis, which was a seven and a half hour drive, consistently 3,000. If we were really good, which we were a lot of years, there was four, five, even 6,000 fans. Wait till you see, the, the, the Shocker fans are licking their chops to only have five and a half hours to drive to the conference tournament. It's a great time to be out of Wichita. It's still cold. We'll go a little south now to Fort Worth, so it's going to be awesome. All right, Wichita fans, three to 5,000. We're holding you to that. Thank you both so much for joining us. Best of luck to you this season. Thanks. 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 Good to see you. Thank you. Mike. Dexter, one of the exciting players in this conference, but when you look at to how the coaches voted this year in terms of the preseason all-conference awards, Jaron Cumberland, no surprise pick to be the player of the year, at least in the preseason. He's battling a foot injury, but from the sounds of it, it looks like he's going to be pretty ready to go. Yeah, I, I think he's just ultra-talented in the fact that, I mean, you heard Coach Brandon talk about, he doesn't make mistakes. And then his three-point shooting improved this past season. We have uh, nothing else to believe, but it's going to improve even more this season. He's so physically gifted that there are no guards in the country, let alone even forwards, that can really bump him off the ball. And then obviously, Quentin Rose for Temple, he's an NBA type player. He, people forget he's a shooting guard. He's six foot eight. He is a big shooting guard. Dejan Giroux is one of the one of the most uh, elite gifted playmakers in the American Conference for Houston. He is a impact player, no question about him. James Weissman, obviously, can't wait to see the talent that he brings to the table. And then Rido, the most underappreciated point guard in all of college basketball for South Florida, led the American Conference in assists and steals. If he does that again this year and USF finishes in the top four, he might compete for that player of the year spot. Mike, when you look at that first team real quick, who is a player that you expect to give Jaron Cumberland a run for his money when it comes to picking up that postseason player of the year athlete? Well, again, I really think if it's not Wiseman, you know, for Memphis, I really think it could be Rito in a chance if South Florida finishes in that top four. If they finish, if they get a bye in that in the conference tournament and South Florida's in there, uh, Rito will be the main reason for that. I think he could compete for player of the year. Who do you like from this preseason second team? Well, for me, uh, uh, Gilbert is so important for UConn and the fact that we haven't really seen him from a standpoint of he just hasn't been healthy. He, haven't, he hasn't had really over 12 months of being 100% healthy, period, and he has that leading into this season. I am a huge fan of Jaden Gardner in East Carolina. You're alma mater, Haley. Jaden right. Gardner it, it almost won uh, freshman of the year last year, barely lost to Alexis Yetna, Jaden Gardner put up monster numbers, was a double-double machine, and with more talent around him, he's only going to perform better. Well, good news for the American Conference is that no other league returns this many award winners from last year. The American has its player of the year returning, defensive player, sixth man, most improved player, and the freshman of the year returning. So all back and excited to see what they can accomplish this year. We now welcome Jeff Wilson, who is ESPN senior manager for programming and events. Jeff, thanks for taking some time to stop by. Uh, now in your fifth year at ESPN, after serving as the assistant AD um, at director and operations at Temple, uh, what has been the transition like from campus to network? Yeah, it's been uh, it, it's been fun. It's um, you know something that you know I absolutely love what I'm doing now, where I'm working with all different teams, coaches, administrators, conferences, just to put together schedules and put together our early season events. Um, you know, so couldn't be happier with where I am, especially as a college basketball guy. But at the same time, wouldn't trade my experience on campus for anything. I think you know being at Temple and particularly learning from Coach Dunf really prepared me and put me in a position to you know to kind of. Move, take this next step. I think people think it's easy, right? You know, you just throw a couple teams together, you make a schedule, and oh, let's go, let's announce it, and that's fine. But there's so much more that goes into that. Can you talk about a little bit more in detail what that day to day is like for you from a scheduling standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it starts, you know, it starts really, it's a year, year round constant process, um, but it really kind of starts in, in vain during. Um, you know, right after the Final Four, where we start to prepare for the next next uh, season, 
and you know, so it's constant back and forth w between us and uh, the schools and the conferences, um, getting those schedules together throughout the summer and into you know early to mid September once everything gets released. But um, you know, it's an interesting process because all of the conferences sort of play off each other. Everybody plays on you know the same night um, so often that you know you're trying to balance and make sure that you've got the best schedule top to bottom throughout the entire season and trying to fill in holes where you can and make sure you're not too overloaded on other days. So right. It's, if uh, it's if a, a school process. doesn't like their schedule, they just yell at you. You, right? Yeah, Is yeah, that, yeah, exactly. We, we kind of can hide behind the conferences a little bit there, but no, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of back and forth with, with us and schools and conferences. That sounds like it could be extremely overwhelming when you factor in all the leagues and teams and determining which games end up on which dates and times. Like, how do you manage that process? What yeah, is the biggest key? Like, how do you do it? Um, a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> um, there, we've got there's three of us that are at ESPN that are dedicated to college basketball. So we we kind of split it up where we each kind of take the lead on certain conferences. But we're in constant communication and we're all kind of strategizing together to to try to make sure we're staying in touch on the latest developments. And and you know as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of back and forth. And so you want to make sure that you're kind of giving each league their their opportunity, you know, sort of in the spotlight and that you're not positioning everybody to go on the same Saturday and leaving that previous Thursday, you know, wide open and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, a lot of puzzle pieces to put together. Listen, I don't know how you do it, man. I, I couldn't do it. It's a tough job, no question. But when you're not pouring over those spreadsheets and you get a chance to maybe watch this conference, who are some of the teams that you're really looking forward to? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the, the um, Memphis storyline is, is very intriguing this year for sure. Um, you know, we're excited to see, you know, how, how that comes together. Um, we actually have them early in the season in our Phil Knight Invitational against Oregon, which is um, two of the top recruiting classes in the nation. So I think two teams that are, you know, in many ways in kind of a similar, similar place to, to see, you know, what they have very early in the season. Um, certainly Houston and the job that, that Coach Sampson has done over the years, um, they're always going to be in the mix. Um, Coach Brandon coming in with Cincinnati and, you know, be interested to see how he puts his mark on that program. Um, you know, Wichita State, you, I could go on, but it's, you know, yeah, you're locked deep, in. Man. Deep yeah. league that, uh, you know, Stop. I think Jeff it'll up be. Jeff, you're previewing all these teams <laughs> yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be a, a fun, exciting year for sure. Jeff, how has your perspective on scheduling and TV changed now that you're looking at it from the network view as opposed, as opposed to the coach or team view? Yeah, it's been interesting for me the last couple of years as I've been on this, you know, specific assignment um, in scheduling just to see, you know, all the contractual behind the scenes work that, that goes into it and you know when you're on the school side if you're a fan or even you know on the coaching staff or administrator you kind of see the schedule and you say all right well we got this game on ESPN this game on ESPN U and you don't really put a whole lot of thought into the process but you know on the back end to know that each conference is different and in some conferences you know one thing that's one of the most fun parts for me is it's basically like a fantasy draft um, where we'll sit down with our with the other conference partners and you know get on a conference call and say okay well first pick we're going to take this game and then you know you're up next and you're going to take that game and you kind of strategize you know again much like how to be a fly you know, in the wall for that draft yeah, type yeah. Of thing. you were just mentioning several teams in this league but especially from your time spent at temple how does your familiarity with the american help you when it comes to scheduling games for espn networks yeah, I think it's uh, it's definitely been helpful. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we split it up so that we take lead on certain conferences, and so having that familiarity with the programs and, and the coaches to kind of lean on them for some some input has been uh, invaluable. And I think just you know the general background of, of working in the American and, and at Temple um, with you know directly with a team kind of helps in this role to know more what coaches are looking for, how they're going to react to their schedules, and, and that sort of thing. All right, Jeff, thanks so much for stopping by, giving us some insight on how that schedule comes together. Everyone just gets to see the final pretty product on paper, but months of worth go into yeah, that. So thanks appreciate so much. Your time. All, right. all right, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we are going to continue talking all things American Hoops here at Media Day. Stay with us. Hey Mike, you know what that is. 
You're always looking forward to uh, that next meal. That is uh, the classic uh, Philadelphia cheesesteaks, Gino's Pats. A, uh, double steak, please, double steak. Double, yeah, you know, people are always debating between Gino's and Pats, but there's so many other uh, great options in the mix. So I feel like yeah, you can't really go wrong in Philadelphia. Are you a whiz wit or whiz without? Kind well, you got to go whiz. I mean, what's, if you're not going whiz, <laughs> what, what are we even doing here? You know what I mean? That's right. Yeah. Well, anyways, we are going to move on. We are going to talk some Tulane. Uh, last March, Tulane announced Ron Hunter as its new head coach. And Hunter might be one of the most fun guys to talk to in this room, Mike. And he is certainly excited for the challenge to come. At Tulane, I had a chance to catch up with the first-year head coach last night. All right, Coach, first season at Tulane. What has been your first impression since stepping foot on campus? Well, outside of the oysters and all the great food in New Orleans, it's, uh, it's been great. You know, we've kind of revamped our team, and we've got a lot of transfers and a lot of guys that uh, uh, it's kind of like last chance you at, uh, at Tulane right now, including the coach. Uh, but we're really excited. Uh, you know, this is a great league, and uh, we're excited to, uh, to bring all this newness to the league. One of the transfers on your roster is former American Rookie of the Year, K.J. Lawson, who was competing at Memphis at the time. What experience does he bring to your roster, not only in collegiate basketball, but playing in this conference? Well, it's really important because he's had success in this conference. I mean, he and, and you know, only got a couple of guys have had some success in this conference, and he's one of them. And so he's our leader. He's our team captain. He's doing terrific. He's, he's going to save, as I always talk about, his best for last. But uh, uh, KG is a terrific young man, and I'm really proud of him, and I'm glad that he gets to, you know, gets to finish his career where he started it. 11 newcomers on this roster. How has your staff been working to build the chemistry of this team as you look ahead to this season? You know, that's been something unique for us to do with, with really the new staff and new coaches, but we've had a lot of fun doing it, especially you can do that in New Orleans. There's not a lot of places you can start new and, and have fun doing it, uh, but we're definitely doing it in New Orleans, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, and, and again, you, we've got grad transfers. We've got some guys that have played in the NCAA tournament, and we've got some guys that did some different things. So I'm just excited for these kids, and, uh, you know, we feel like we got something to prove, and it's going to be a lot of fun. and, and uh, you know, Tulane has struggled, but uh, we're back. You bring a lot of veteran head coaching experience into this program. How can you help develop this culture and bring it back to a winning Tulane program? Well, you know, every place we went, we, we've been, we've had to kind of rebuild it, whether it was IEPY, whether it was Georgia State. This is our next move now in, in, in the Tulane. So, uh, you know, we're not doing anything different than we've done before. I didn't take this job to come here and wait five, six, seven years to win. We're going to win right now, and we're excited about that. We've got great young men in our program. And, uh, again, Tulane's a great institution, and, and it's just time. And everything's about timing, and it's Tulane's time right now. As a head coach, what is the first step that you take when it comes to rebuilding a program? Uh, finding KJ Lawson. <laughs> you got to get good players, you know. <laughs> so that's the only reason I've been coaching long enough. You find a good players like my son and KJ and George Hill. You find those kind of guys, and uh, it tends to work. But uh, no, nah, it's uh, you know again, basketball is basketball. We, we, we've got some, you know, we're an older team. Last year, Tulane was a young basketball team with a lot of freshmen, and you know we've got four or five guys, 23 years old and older. And so this, these guys have been around, and uh, they know this is their last stop this year, and so we're ready to have fun with it. Speaking of your son, you had the really unique opportunity that not many head coaches get to have in coaching him at your previous stop. How has that kind of carried with you as you continue on in your career? It's been great. You know, people still remember the shot that he made, and, and uh, it's been something that I'll never forget. It's been a great part of, uh, of our family, and it's been a great part of my career in that regards. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm really happy for him, and he's happy for me. We, we, you know, we, we talk about it all the time. And you know, even in the airport, I got off the airplane. First time somebody stopped me was asking me about, "Hey, how's your son doing in the shot?" So uh, it's, it's terrific. Now we got to make uh, we got to make new memories and new headlines here at Tulane. All right, last question, maybe the hardest one. Favorite restaurant so far in New Orleans? Oh my goodness, you can't ask me that. Oh wow. My favorite restaurant in New Orleans is the ones that are owned by Tulane alumnus. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Good job, Coach. Well, welcome to the American and best of luck this season. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> <Did> it. <laughs> Smart answer, Mike. Favorite restaurant, one owned by a Tulane alum. He knows what he's doing. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we now welcome in USF here at American Media Day head coach Brian Gregory and junior guard David Collins. Coach, heading into this year, you return all five starters from a team that was able to capture that CBI title last year. How great of an opportunity is it for you to be able to build off of that foundation? Well, I thought last year as we ended it, we were playing our best basketball of the season. Um, and with all five starters back, nine out of our top ten, uh, some different expectations heading into this year. But we can't lose focus of what got us to this point in terms of building it relatively quickly. And that's our guys have done a great job of every day focusing on just getting better. And if we continue to do that, 
we got good enough players and deep enough team that I think we'll take another step this year. David, you had a pretty interesting transition, right? You know, year one as a freshman, you were asked to score a lot. You know, year two as a sophomore, you had some help. You had Q, you had a bunch of pieces around you with Alexis. I mean, year three, what are we supposed to expect from David Collins in South Florida right now? You know, I just try to uh, give the team what it needs, whatever it is that day, you know, uh, giving assists or rebounding or if I have to score, you know, just doing what the coach asks me, and that's pretty much what I do. That's the coach's answer right there. <laughs> Man, that was great. You got to love well that. Trained. Yeah. Well trained. You know, he, he, he can impact the game in so many different ways. Uh, with him and LaQuincy in the backcourt, a, a great defensive backcourt, uh, not only creating turnovers, which help us on offense, uh, but also disrupting the other team's offensive actions as well. So, you know, David's one of those guys, if, he, if you need him to get 20, he can get 20. If it's got to be 10 and 5 assists and 7 rebounds, he does do what I ask him, which is the reason he's played so many minutes in <laughs> his career. So we have, um, you and I had a chance to talk a lot, uh, you know, last season. And one of my favorite things where you and I were talking where you, you felt like you were making some strides, maybe a little bit ahead of schedule, but you wanted to trust the process. And that phrase is so cliched and overused, but you had a great definition for it. You said it's trying to get better every single day, but still having patience with the long-term vision. I mean, how much did you talk about that with your team last season? We, we talk about it all the time, you know, because with new expectations, our number one expectation is you're a better player today than you were yesterday. And at the same time, you have to have long-range goals of where you want to get to as a, as, a, as a program. But a lot of times, those aren't. that's not easy. You got to be okay with being uncomfortable in terms of your growth. And you're going to have some adversity. And how do you handle that adversity during a long season is really important and, and paramount for us to be successful this year. David, a unique opportunity for your team this past summer to continue growing on the court, but your team got to take a pretty fun trip to Canada over the summer. How did that trip help this team continue to grow and develop in the offseason? I think we built a lot of team chemistry on that trip, you know, just hanging out and enjoying uh, Quebec and Montreal and playing against some different teams that play with different styles, and you had to respond well to how they play, and they definitely moved the ball differently than how we do in America, so it was something to get used to. Did you get some of that poutine? in Canada, man? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what, was your, what was your favorite memory from that trip outside of basketball? We saw some nice team photos there. Uh, what was your favorite thing that you guys did? Uh, we visited some like churches and it was just some great views. We went on top of like, it's like a, a dormant volcano and we got to see the view from the top and it was very beautiful. So you've got two players, I think, that are severely underappreciated throughout the country, uh, just from a national viewpoint. One is Alexis Yetna, but really, I think the most underappreciated point guard in the country is LaQuincy Rideau. I mean, you lead the conference in assists and steals, and it almost kind of goes unnoticed, but that's almost like his personality a little bit, though. Yeah, you know, it, with, with him and David, the heart and soul of our, our team, and LaQuincy had a tremendous junior year, and I, I, I agree with him. Like, it, maybe underappreciated. The only guard in the country to lead their league in assists and steals. Um, but he's ready and poised for a great senior year as well. When we needed him to score, he was able to score points for us also. But he sets the tone and tempo for everything we do on the defensive end. And the one thing he's been able to do with, with David is create a backcourt offensively that can really score points. Or, as I said earlier, if it's time just to create some opportunities for other guys, to do that as well. I think you forgot, and you know, as you even told me last year, I forget as a coach how much we relied on Alexis, and he's just a freshman. He was just so good that there were times you had to remind yourself that he's still learning the game. I remember one of the games at the end of the year against the ball. I'm, I'm getting on him pretty good because he gave up an offensive rebound in a, in a critical time. Then I look at the stats, he's got 25 points and 15 <laughs> rebounds, and I'm like, I had to call him over and, and, and kind of help him out a little bit there. But you expect so much, but at the same time, he does do a lot of stuff that, that goes unnoticed. And he's um, if he doesn't get the rebound, the one thing he's tremendous at, his guy never gets one. Mm -hmm. And so that really helps us because with LaQuincy and David, we have two of the best rebounding guards in the country as well. And when they get a defensive rebound, that really ignites our break. David, you've had the opportunity to now play for Coach Gregory. And heading into this third season, what has been the most rewarding part about being a part of that growth and that step forward that this team has taken each and every season? I think it's really big, you know, to be a part of something that you feel like you you helped turn around the program. You know, I'm used to playing at programs where we were just always good, but to be a part of something is, is definitely bigger. 
Where will we see your game in particular take that next step this season? What have you been working on the most in the summer? I think making the game easier for myself, uh, just like taking a shot at the defense, getting me mid ranges, and you know, just getting my teammates open and getting them more involved. Front court was big, strong, really aggressive. You guys owned the boards. The rim protection was fantastic. But Justin Brown was that guy that could kind of stretch the defense. I mean, is he the, is he really that kind of X factor, especially sometimes coming off the bench, coming in and knocking threes? He, he is important. Uh, Three-point lines moving back. Uh, but we need him to make shots for us. And his game has expanded in, in ability to use a shot fake and go to a pull-up mid-range jump shot as well. But he, whenever he shot the ball well, we were very difficult to beat because, as you said, we had really good interior defense. Mike Dura only as a freshman with the minutes that he logged has made a big step. And we've talked about David and LaQuincy. So the opportunity for another guy, a fourth scorer sometimes, to really impact the game has uh, had a huge positive impact on us. Talked a little bit about rebounding. How about your sophomore forward, Michael Durr? He stands at a very tall seven feet. How impactful can he be this season? Well, I think he's taking a big step for us, uh, especially maybe even during the last half of the year, the last 10 games of the year, he averaged almost nine rebounds a game. I think he got used to Alexis getting so many, he, he got a little upset and wanted to go get some himself, which was good. But he's taking a big step, and we're going to need him to score on the block for us, score on our pick and roll game, and obviously to kind of anchor that defense around the basket. David, you hear Coach mention that the expectations continually change, but seeing what your team was able to accomplish last season, where does that put the mindset of this group with all these returning casts around you? How has that mindset and mentality changed heading into this year of what you might be able to accomplish? We know the expectations are bigger, and we um, we were trying to live up to them, but we're not too focused on that. We know we got to take it day by day, and we know that if we do the right things, the success will come. He's drinking the Kool-Aid, Coach. I mean, those are great yeah, answers. He's a very man. intelligent <laughs> young man, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things is, is you, you start off and then where you want to get to, there are steps and mile markers along the way, and getting guys to believe in what you're, what, what you're saying and that belief turns into behaviors, and that behaviors turn into results, and you're starting to see that process. You got David, you got LaQuincy, but you got Oklahoma State transfer Zach Dawson too. Another element, kind of an offensive threat. Um, what is he? As how has he been in practice so far? Well, I think the the best thing for Zach is he sees the work that David and LaQuincy put in every day. The other thing he gives us, he he's, he's got the ability to create his own shot at any time, he, and and that's something that we needed at times. And so I think he will have a great impact. I think sitting out a couple years is going to you know, be a challenge for him, getting out there and playing right away. But I think he's got a chance before it's all said and done to be one of the better guards in our league. Coach, you talk a lot about the process. So as you head into this brand new season, what is the next step? What is the new goal? Well, I always said, you know, we were 0-7 in our league against teams that played in the NCAA tournament. We were competitive in those games. But the next step is to be able to win some of those games uh, and put us in position. Our, our non-conference schedule was put together to, to have a postseason opportunity at the end. And that's the next step for us. But we can't lose sight of our core principles and our core uh, cultural pieces that have got us to this point right now. And our guys have done a great job of embracing that. All right, thanks a lot, Coach. Thank you, David. Best of luck to you both this season. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. We're going to send it to a quick break, but when we come back, we've got a lot more to get to here at American Men's Basketball Media Day in Philadelphia. The American is committed to ending the stigma related to seeking help for mental health conditions. If you have a mental health condition, no, you're not alone. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health issues in the United States, and more than 30% of student athletes have experienced overwhelming anxiety. Listen to your teammates and others about what they are going through. Think about the words you choose, avoid labels, and use stigma-free language when communicating. Build and use support systems with friends and family. Asking for help can be difficult, but seeking help to improve your health, academic, or athletic performance or another goal is a sign of strength. Hope. Educate. Awareness. Listen. Talk. Help. There are resources on your campus and in your community for help. The American. Building healthy, powerful minds.
be undeniable. Welcome back to American Men's Basketball Media Day. We are now joined here by Jeremy Jordan, who is the Temple faculty athletic representative, and Kira Dolmas, who is a former women's lacrosse player at UConn and now in your grad year. Um, both of these two join us to talk about a very important initiative here in the American Conference, and that is the Powerful Minds Initiative, which looks to end the stigma in regards to mental health. Kira, you've had a big role in this as well as the entire SAC committee, but for people who aren't aware at home about what this initiative is, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to destigmatize mental health. We want to have it at a level where you're as comfortable talking about it as going to a regular doctor's appointment or going to work out even. Jeremy, how have you seen the support and resources grow specifically for student athletes in regards to mental health within your athletic department at Temple? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been exciting to watch because this is not just a student athlete issue, it's a student issue. All our campuses are dealing with this, but I've noticed in our athletic department at Temple and across the conference, they're putting resources behind this. So everyone talks about the importance of making sure we have mental health services for our students and student athletes. But in the American, they're actually creating positions. At Temple, we have two full-time mental health professionals that are working with our student athletes, and it makes a huge difference. You know, I, I'm a former student athlete, as well as Haley, yourself. I've always talked, when I talk about with former student athletes that might be still trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, it's always a lack of identity, right? You're either a ba you're just a basketball player and then you're just a student. It's a lot of times you get so tunnel vision focused like that. I mean, what are some of the things that maybe current student athletes can do from a standpoint of your identity is you're not just a lacrosse player, you're not just a football player, you're so much more than that. And you know that's part of the difficulty is what can you do because it's all, it's person to person, it's all individualized. So it's more a recognition of how can you feel more comfortable and how can you put yourself out there more to a level that you're, you can be everything that's part of your, who you actually are. So it's all, it's all person to person type of thing. I tried, when I was a student athlete, now I'm no longer, <laughs> um, I just got around to my community and got to know other people and figured it out from there. So you see everyone around Media Day today, all of us on the set wearing our green powerful minds and student athletes and coaches as well. But some of these numbers, they're pretty shocking. One in five of US adults, they experience mental health illnesses each and every year. One in 25 of those adults experience serious mental illness each year. But so you look at these numbers, it's obviously an issue that people across this country are dealing with. What are some of the things here on campus that the SAC committee especially is doing to continue promoting that awareness and keep driving this home? So actually today is the launch day for the Powerful Minds campaign and each campus in our, in our conference has on-campus events going on. So for example, UConn has um, Pine Athlete Day where they're raising money to go to Mental Health America. There are events going on at, at Temple with their mental health professionals that every conference or every institution in the conference has events all week long. Uh, Jeremy, so why do you think it's important for student athletes to help kind of carry this message, this statement, you know, throughout the country? Absolutely. Well, our student athletes are our leaders on campus. And so if they're willing to have this conversation and say there's nothing wrong with raising your hand and saying that I need a little bit of help to get things sorted out, it's more likely that other students on campus will feel comfortable. And so it's really important that, that we have our student athletes, especially in the American on our campuses, leading this initiative because others are going to follow and it'll just help us have more in-depth conversations about the issue. Kira, as the National SAC representative and chair of the Americans Board, for people at home looking to get involved with powerful minds and to continue learning about mental health awareness, uh, where can they find information? I know SAC has some different handles and there's a lot of content and information going out this week. So where can people at home or student athletes find that info? They can find all of our information on our American SAC page, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Twitter. There's also information you can follow Mental Health America or any of the other mental health uh, alliances that are available for everybody across the country. All right, thank you, Kira. Thank you, Jeremy. This Absolutely. is a very thank important you. initiative, and we're all happy to support it here today. We're going to keep talking about Powerful Minds, not only today, but all week long, especially on the football front, as it is officially Powerful Minds Week across the America. And thanks to you both. Mike, as a former student athlete, though, when you see this initiative, and it's been going on the past couple of years in the conference, what is the reality of that as a student athlete, sort of being afraid to maybe come out and say that you're supposed to be tough, you're supposed to be an athlete, you're not supposed to be facing some of these problems. So what is, you know, kind of the overall take on that and how important this could be well, for I student think, athletes? Well, I think there is, it's a really good question, I think there is 
actual toughness and being vulnerable. It's just a matter of, of kind of letting go and understanding that there is more to life than maybe just the court. Even though it's hard because your scholarship is based on your athletic performance and your academic performance. And if you get stuck, there's no reason to just try to figure it out in a bubble. It's okay to ask for help. There is personal responsibility that goes along with that, but you're responsible also for asking for help. And I think that's where that toughness and vulnerability can kind of mesh together. Yeah, very important topic. And we're now joined by Temple, who is also wearing their powerful minds fins. First year head coach Aaron McKee and senior guard Quentin Rose. Coach, first year taking the reins at Temple, but Temple is in no way a new program to you. You're right. very familiar. But what are you most looking forward to when it comes to making this program your own this season? Well, coaching my first game, November 5th. <laughs> That's what I'm looking uh, most forward to. But just really seeing what I'm made of. I've been a competitor all my life from playing basketball to now coaching and, and I want to take that same competitive spirit that I had in playing and, and use it with coaching and, and share it with my team, with my players. When you look back to your career being a player at Temple and your NBA career, how rewarding is it to be able to take those reins and coach your alma mater? It's the, it's the cherry on top. I mean, I went from a kid that, that grew up watching the uh, Big Five and watching Temple and studying Temple to being a student athlete and playing at Temple University you know, being a college athlete and playing. And now I get the opportunity to, to coach my alma mater. It's, it's truly an honor for me. So you talk a little bit about Quentin Rose here, the experience coming off going to the SMLA tournament. You know, I mean, you get the at-large bid. You're on the bubble, probably sweating it out. <laughs> you know, how do you carry that momentum, you know, going into the summer, going into preseason practice? Because this is a still an ultra-talented Temple team. Mm -hmm. oh, we just use that motiv motivation, you know. Like, we got a taste last year. And we all like the feeling, so our whole mindset is just but get back and make some noise. And what about some of the new guys? Any, any, any young pups come on? Because you're, you're the old guy now. You know, it feels <laughs> yeah, like you've been in the league forever. <laughs> you know, who are the young pups for Temple that you've been like, okay, this guy can really hoop? Uh, Josh Pierre Louis, uh, Dane Dunn. Both of those guys are real talented. Put the ball in the, put the, ball in the hoop, uh, make their teammates better, get out in transition, like how, how we want to play this year. So, I mean, I think they'll both help us a lot. Hey, coach, you know, what does Quentin really bring to the game here? You know, he's, he's ultra talented, he's incredibly dynamic. He had a great summer of preparation. But what are you really expecting from him this season? Well, outside of his uh, scoring ability, you know, he has a chance to score, be a 2,000 point scorer in college basketball. Not a lot of guys can, can say that, but I'm, I'm looking for his leadership on the court and, and off the court. He's going to have to help me lead some of these younger guys, some of these guys with a little lesser experience than, than he has. He's been around the program. He's been involved. He knows how I am. He's been around me. So I, I'm looking forward to, to, one, him taking on the challenge and me taking on the challenge and, and coaching him. And, we bring it together, I think we can be pretty successful. Yeah, I'm just helping you out, because if you didn't know before, now you know now, man, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Coach, how about your junior guard, Nate Pierre-Louis? He was named the co-most improved player in the American Athletic Conference this year, but as a coach, never settle. Where do you look for Pierre-Louis to take his game to the next level this season? Just his energy. He has to be the best defender in the country for us. He has to be the best rebounder in the country um, for us at his, at his guard position. And I love his energy. He's very coachable. And he's one of the hardest working basketball players I've ever been around. And I play basketball on all the levels, um, from high school to college and the pros. And I've been around some hard working dudes, but I haven't seen many that work as hard as Nate. And, and I'm looking for him to take that next step in, in maturing his game. But you know, for us, we need him to, to defend at a high level. We need him to rebound at that guard position at a high level, and he's looking to embrace that, that challenge that he has in front of him. Really a lot of talented pieces in place. What about J.P. Mormon? What does he bring to Temple this season? He's the linchpin for us. He's the guy that brings it all together for us. Um, he's a cerebral basketball player, and he has to make shots for us. Um, J.P., I think, can give us an advantage. He's that stretch four, if, if, if you recall. He's a guard, but we use him as a as a stretch four, so he can pick and pop and make shots and, and pull bigger guys out. If he get a smaller guy uh, on him, he can roll to the basket and he can play, you know, inside and take advantage of his size inside. So he's a versatile player for us, and I'm looking for big things out of him. Quentin, Mike called you the old guy on this Temple team, but <laughs> heading into your senior season, at what point do you think it will finally set in that each of these things you do are kind of going to be those last at Temple, starting here at American Media Day? Uh, I think it's already set in. Uh, like just going in every day in practice, I just have the mindset like this is my last go around, so I have to treat it as so, and I want to go out the right way, and I think all my teammates want us, us seniors to go out the right way. So I mean, 
Yeah, I think it'll be good. Coach, your team had a chance to take a once-in-a-lifetime trip to the Bahamas this past summer. How did that specifically help this group grow in terms of getting ready for the season ahead? It helped us grow. It, it helped me coach. That was my first opportunity to be able to coach those guys and, and get in a different environment for us. We practiced throughout the summer. And we were able to get on a plane and go play some, some different uh, competition out in the Bahamas. And it was, it was pretty good. Some games were good, some were not so good, but it gave me a chance to get some experience as a, as a head coach. It also gave us the opportunity to bond on and off the floor. Um, we all share stories. I share, share some stories of myself, some good and some bad, to, to close the gap between coach and player. And I think that's important now dealing with these kids. We talk about mental wellness and, and, and mental health. It's important that they get a good sense of, of who I am, um, not just as a coach, but as a person. And I thought that was an, important. And they got a chance to have some fun out there, stick their feet in the sand, play in that nice pretty blue water out there in the Bahamas, so it was, it was pretty cool. We got a chance to really bond on and off the court. Sounds like a wonderful once-in-a-lifetime trip, and unfortunately, Coach, we're getting word that they are waiting for you on this Coach's Brown table up on the stage, so we've got to let you guys go. <laughs> but if you would like to hear more from Head Coach Aaron McKee, you can head over to Twitter at American <laughs> underscore MBB, but we'll certainly keep this conversation going with Temple. Thanks to both of you, and best Thank of luck this you. season. Right, Thank you. <laughs> Mike, when you look at this Temple team, it is one that comes from this legendary head coach and friend Dunphy and what program he was able to build over the years. But with McKee now taking over and a familiar face, how does that help in that transition? Well, from one legend to another legend, <laughs> you know, I think it was, it, it had to be a seamless transition, right? Because Dunphy is once in a lifetime, you and I, especially, we had such a great relationship with him. But Aaron McKee, having played there, playing in the NBA, he's a Philly guy. That's such a great hire by Temple, and I think it was a perfect transition. The players were already comfortable. He was on the bench for six years with, uh, with Coach Dunphy, and he's got, he has a lot of talent. Temp if Temple gets back to the NCAA tournament, I won't be shocked because you've got Quentin Rose, a lot of number of pieces, Alani Moore. It's going to be a very, very good Temple team, again, as we expected. Pretty neat in the American, Aaron McKee, a Temple alum, former NBA player, also Penny Hardaway. So we've got these alums that have very gone cool. on to the NBA and coming back to their campuses. All right, Mike, let's move on and talk a little bit about Tulsa. They are picked to finish 10th in this year's preseason poll, but Frank Hates group has seven newcomers, but he's going to look strongly to forward Martins Igbanu, who you had a chance to catch up with last night. Uh, Martins, you know, obviously every single year since Tulsa's been the American, you guys have exceeded preseason expectations. You know, why is that and what kind of culture do you have there at Tulsa? Um, we've, um, with Coach Hate, since I've been there, we've created a culture where it doesn't you know, we all we got. That's we always say that when we leave the hoodie. So, you know, it doesn't matter what somebody else says outside. I mean, those are experts. They do what they're, um, you know, they're paid to do. We do what we're meant to do. So we come in, we walk hard. We don't care about where you rank us or whatever. We just want to win the day, win the possession, win the game. So we know all of that takes care of itself. Whether you rank us last or first, that doesn't change anything for us. We know what we're here to do. So you're one of the top front court players in the American Conference, but you know you're the type of player that's gotten better every single year. What did you work on this summer to get yourself ready for this season? Uh, this summer, um, like every other summer, you know, I work on my strengths and also my weaknesses. So that was what I did this um, this summer also. But I also spent a lot of time, you know, trying to get to know the new guys and understanding how to play with them. And so what we did was we played a lot of pickup on almost every day. So we got that done just to get used to playing with each other. So this summer was more on working on also being a better leader. And that was something I talked to Coach Hayden about, wanting to be a better leader than I was last year and the year before that. So I, I could say I pretty much worked on every piece of the party this summer. So speaking of the new guys, so who's going to surprise us this year for Tulsa? Who's going to surprise you guys this year for Tulsa? Yeah, which one of your teammates? It's it's going to be a it's going that's an interesting question because there's no new guys you're like, "Whoa, he can really hoop," you know, when he first got here. It's, not, it's, it's more like all of them can really hoop. So, it's like I really can't tell you who, but I can just tell you to watch out for all of them. Even the freshmen can really play. They've been they've made great strides in practice since day one. The transfers are doing really well. So, uh, that's a very interesting question I didn't have an answer for, but I can tell you all of them are going to be ready. Good stuff. Thanks, Martins. Yes, thank you, sir.
So last uh, last year's best perimeter players really have left for Tulsa, you know, uh, and you've got Sterling Taplin, Daquan Jeffries are gone. Martin Zigbanu is one of the best front court players in the comp. They're going to have to play through him. Tulsa will have to play through Zigbanu. He's physical, he's strong, he's aggressive, really relentless around the gra around the glass. And you pair him with shooting forwards Jariah Horn. Lawson Corita, who can really stretch the defense every single year since Tulsa has been in the American Conference. They have exceeded preseason expectations. Coach Haith is a great coach, and he puts players in spots to be successful. That player in particular, Lawson Corita, needs a big season for Tulsa. He has spurts to where he can make two or three threes quickly, needs to be more of a consistent threat on the perimeter because Tulsa will have to stretch the defense more, knowing that Martin Zigbanu, they're gonna play through him through the majority of the offense. But Tulsa, you can never bet against the Golden Hurricane anytime you suit up against him. I just got word from Houston head coach Kelvin Sampson that Martin Zigbanu is a pretty good player in this conference, uh, one that Houston will certainly have to prepare for this year. All right, we're now joined by Kelvin Sampson and junior guard Dejan Giroux. Thanks to both of you for stopping by. Coach, looking for your fifth straight postseason appearance since taking over this program. The players have come and gone, but what has allowed you to keep this program competing at a, not only a consistent level, but ultimately taking that next step forward each year? Well, good players there. I mean, easy answer is culture, but you'd have bad players and great culture and lose. Um, but we've, we've had really good players. Uh, we have a solid culture. Uh, and I've been lucky to keep my staff together too. You know, you, you know, uh, we've had some guys with opportunities to leave uh, that have elected to stay, and that's made our program better. But when you can have consistency throughout uh, the culture, uh, the discipline, the accountability, um, and then they start passing it down to each other. You know, Damian Dotson, his group, down to Rob Gray and that group. Rob Gray to Galen and Corey and that group. Now Galen and Corey's pass it down to uh, Dejan and Nate. And then uh, uh, they'll pass it down to another group. But I, I think there's an understanding of how we want to do things. And we have good kids that uh, really embrace that. Coach, you mentioned your staff and family being a big part of that, especially for you on a personal yeah. level. But how does that family atmosphere carry over into what this program does? Well, I have four former players that are on our staff. And then my son and my uh, daughter. Um, my daughter really is in charge of everything. The brains of the operation. Yeah, real boss. <laughs> if you don't believe, if you don't believe me, ask her. Um, but she she certainly coaches her father and her brother hard. I know that. But um, it's just uh, you know we we know when to work and we know when to play. Um, uh, you know, our strength coach is tremendous. Uh, every, everything in our program, I think, is uh, set up for our kids to be, to be successful. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I tell our system coaches all the time. You can't spend enough time with the players. You know, um, we don't have to be their life, but they certainly are our lives. So, uh, Dejan, so you had a great opportunity to learn from you know, really good leaders on last year's team, you know, Corey, Galen, Armani. What are some of the things that you took away from them? Because you're, I mean, you're the guy from a leadership standpoint on the court now that's really trying to teach some of the younger guys how to play Houston basketball. Yeah, um, Galen taught me a lot. Uh, playing behind him um, as a backup point guard um, taught me how to be on time early, how to talk to somebody, um, and just how to be a leader. Um, Corey and Armani, they did a great job of coming to practice every day, um, ready to work, and I kind of learned from that. Um, I wasn't a practice player when I first got here, but um, I'm kind of embracing it because that's our culture, and, and this whole program is, is all about culture. So you talked about showing up early. Coach, it's my understanding that you're a big, you know, 15 minutes early kind of guy to meetings, and, <laughs> and I heard a story that um, actually the first the first day on the court that the guys were even earlier than the 15-minute window, and everybody was really excited about that. Well, I've actually had to recalibrate what time we start. Um, I'll give you I'll, I'll give you a, a, a quick story. Uh, usually, somewhere in the s first six practices, I usually kick them out of practice, um, either out of necessity or convenience. But it can be either one. Um, and so we come in the next morning, usually around 6:30 or so. So let's say it's a seven o'clock practice. I usually walk on the court at 6:30 because I want to see who's first, and now I also want to see who's last. I walked on the court uh, at 6.30 and everybody was there. Wow. And that's for a 7 o'clock practice. So wow. it tells me that they, they're starting to get it, 
but uh, it's all about leadership. You know, De Dejan's right. He he was not a practice player when he first got he got here. He thought he thought practice was something you did on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize you actually practiced basketball. But um, I, I think it goes back to character. The reason why San Antonio won all those championship. Not because they were loaded top to bottom. They had their Hall of Famers, but their culture, their culture made them consistent. And I, and I think that, that our, our culture has a lot to do with our consistency. And you were really riding Nate hitting on that last last season. Yeah. You know, I mean, what are some of the strides that you see him taking over the reins this season? You know, I've always recruited our captains. When I was recruiting Galen, I said he'll be a captain one day. And I said the same thing about Nate. But the most important thing I can teach these kids when they first get here uh, Mike and Haley is is how to practice the, the expectations uh, that we have for you in practice uh, the intensity level um, making them understand the importance of, of not just playing hard but competing and, and we do that in everything we do that's where that's why there's a time and a goal element in every drill uh, we keep score which means we have a winner and a loser in everything we do uh, you're rewarded for winning and you're you're held accountable for for losing if you don't give great effort so we, we spend a lot of time coaching effort um, and toughness. Coach, you return Nate, you return Dejan, but ultimately you have to replace that Sweet 16 backcourt from last year. How yeah. do you go about taking those steps to replace those holes? Yeah, I remember sitting here last year, uh, Haley, you guys asked me the same thing about Rob and Devin Davis. People forget how good a player Devin Davis was. Tremendous. Yeah, and uh, West Van Beck and Nurizana. I, I, I lost four key guys off the team that could have gone to the Sweet 16. Uh, other, uh, um, well, that shot from uh, Michigan we won't talk about. But um, So, you know, we've had experience with this. You know, we focus on what this team can do good. Last year's strengths was uh, behind the three-point line offensively. Uh, this year's strength will be inside the three-point line. Doesn't mean we're going to be a bad three-point shooting team. We're just not going to be as good, and that's okay. Don't don't misinterpret, don't misinterpret what uh, a, a team's strength is from year to year. Uh, just because we're not as good a three-point shooting team doesn't mean that we can't win another way. And that's the way we've always approached it. What is it we do good? Let's focus on that. What are some of the things that Fabian White does well? It needs a, needs a big season for you guys. Had spurts last year where he looked like just dominant in the front court. Yeah, you, you know, Mike, he broke his foot June 23rd, and we didn't get him back until December 1st. That means he didn't get conditioning. He didn't get preseason. He didn't get individual workouts. He didn't get team workouts. We opened the arena against Oregon on December 1st. That was his first game. So as we went through December, January, he started getting in shape and, and, and had some big games down the stretch. But we're counting on Fabian this year. You know, he is the only returning starter. Um, but he, when he got here, he was 6'6", about 196. Now he's almost 6'8", and he weighs about 225, 230. So he's gotten bigger and stronger. He's gotten tougher. He's got a little uh, more of a main streak. And his decision making has uh, improved. So we're expecting big things from Big Fabian. Coach, how about Cedric Alley? He stepped in for Fabian early last season and competed ultimately yeah. in all 37 games. How did that game experience help him grow? That's a great point, Haley, because we had a couple of games last year we wouldn't have won without Cedric. Uh, I remember earlier in the year, we're still trying to find our way. He made five threes at BYU, which was a great road win. And then uh, at Central Florida, uh, Johnny Staff did a great job of coming out in the triangle in two. We hadn't seen it, but we had prepared for it. We knew we were going to see it eventually. And it just so happened it was that night, and we, we had a, a little action. We run against that. But Sed made three threes in the first half, and they got out of it. And that uh, so Seb was a big part of that win and some other wins. But uh, and he's just a sophomore. He's a sophomore. Uh, we won't start any seniors this year. We we have our youngest uh, team, but we're de we're either deceptively young or deceptively veteran. <laughs> I haven't figured it out yet. Coach, your team had a pretty unique experience this past summer, getting to travel to Italy to play basketball. Yeah. How can a trip like that impact this group heading into the season ahead? I think it impacts them more off the court because it brings them closer together. Um, you know, you know it's a good day when you're riding on the bus um, somewhere around Lake Como, and in the back they're they're debating what's better, ice cream or gelato. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually a good day. But uh, we saw just about everything you can imagine to see in Italy, from the Spanish Steps to the Colosseum, the Forum. Uh, we saw um, uh, Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Campo Chapel. We saw the Leonardo da Vinci's uh, original uh, painting of The Last Supper. 
Uh, and, and our kids got three credits. You know, they've, it, they've, it'll be at the, in December at the end of the first semester, but uh, it, culturally, academically, basketball, camaraderie, everything was great. Got a dangerous question for you today, Joan. What's your favorite part <laughs> of a Coach Sampson practice? Oh, my favorite part of practice. Bring it in. Practice. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah, bring it in. But um, the, the way we compete every day, um, we treat uh, every practice like it's a real game. Um, every practice is just so intense. Um, the red team versus the white team every day. Coach Kellen has the white team. Coach Sam has the red team. And it's just it's just competitive. Um, Coach Kellen always yell out. Anytime we get on the line, their problems is not ours. Um, I used to be on that white team last year. And, and practice, practice real. But now on the red team, it's like the white team come after us every day. So it's just, it's just competitive, and it just makes everybody better. It's a pretty good answer, Coach. Great it's pretty good answer. Dijon, going back to that Italy trip, uh, we even saw some proof, some evidence that you guys got some work done in the gym. Uh, what was the intensity level like at that practice compared to practice back in Houston? Was it any different? <laughs> it was different. Practice in Italy was crazy, especially the the heat. As soon as we step on the court, it's like we started sweating. No um, air conditioning. Yeah, we, we had to take off our jerseys. It, it was just crazy. It's hot in Houston. But it was, a, it, it was a, another, we have air conditioning. another conditioning week. But um, Italy was a great trip. Um, I'm glad I, I got the experience. What was your favorite site that you got to see? Lake Como. Um, just that view was just, was just beautiful. Um, the water, just everything that was behind it, uh, all the houses that was on the water. That, it, it's like it made me see a different, you know, a different part of life. Dejan, from the sounds of it, it sounds like you've experienced a lot of personal growth in your time at Houston. How do you plan to use your experiences from last March's postseason run to fuel the way that your team prepares for this season? Um, just being a leader, um, working on my leadership every day, um, trying to help lead this team. Um, my teammates got my back, and I, I have to have their back. So. Um, really my leadership and um, on the court just slowing down and just being on the same page as Coach Sam so I can, you know, help help this team get back to where we left off. All right, well, thank you so much for both of you for stopping by. Best of thank luck you, to you this Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right. Mike, in the American Conference, we have a lot to talk about in terms of the season ahead. Thanks to you both. Um, but a lot of excitement in this league in terms of playing basketball beyond the collegiate level. And uh, even this week, we saw some excitement surrounding UCF former player Taco Fall. But when you look at the American in relation to the NBA, who are some of those players that are standing out to you that are kind of making their presence known at the next level? Well, you know, you just mentioned him. And Taco Fall has been the most exciting thing kind of in the NBA. And I watched uh, Summerlee closely out in Vegas. And he actually had a line of 350 people deep to get an autograph after the game. He was a rock star, almost on par with Zion Williamson. And actually, it's funny that uh, Chris Paul walked by uh, uh, Taco Fall and nobody even paid attention to him because everybody wanted Taco Fall's autograph. And uh, yesterday, he just signed an official two-way contract with the Boston Celtics, which means he's officially on the roster for the Boston Celtics, which is really exciting. He earned that spot. Aubrey Dawkins is with the, uh, on the 20-man roster for the New Orleans Pelicans. You also have Daquan Jeffries made the 20-man roster for the Orlando Magic. I've had an opportunity to see uh, uh, Jeffries, da Daquan Jeffries from Tulsa this past year. Uh, B.J. Taylor will most likely play playing on the G League team for the Magic. And then Jeremiah Martin, kind of one of those, like just a great score, one of the best scorers in the American Conference, is fighting for that 20-man roster spot for the Miami Heat. A lot of American Conference talent really pushing the limits in the NBA. Anything to get that selfie with Taco Fall, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to have a selfie stick. How do you to even do it, Mike? I'm sure you've done it. Just stand on the chair. It? No, I, I'm not a big selfie guy. You know, <laughs> but uh, you have to stand on the chair if you're going to take a selfie with Taco Fall. When it comes to the American, you know, we've been talking a lot today about the competitiveness from top to bottom and how this league has grown over the years. If you're a recruit deciding on what college you're going to, how much more impressive has the American come in terms of if you have those aspirations to play at the next level? Well, you know that four or five teams every single year are going to be in the NCAA tournament, and that's a big deal. And then you add on the fact that Memphis is going to continue to try to bring in the number one recruiting class in the country every single uh, time. Uh, that means Houston, Wichita State, Cincinnati, South Florida, UCF. They're all going to try to bring in even better recruiting classes. So you're playing against 
you're playing against Memphis, you're playing against Houston, you're playing against Wichita State, you're playing against uh, uh, UCF, South Florida, all tournament teams. So when you're a recruit, you know going in the American Conference, you're going to have an opportunity really at any school to compete for an NCAA tournament at large bid. You don't have to just go out and win your tournament. This is a four to five bid league uh, conference minimum, and that goes a long way on the recruiting trail. Penny Hardaway has brought a lot of hype at Memphis, and um, I won't speak for you, but probably something that we haven't seen so far in the American is having a couple of freshmen enter in their freshman season at a program. Precious Achua, James Weissman, potential first-round draft picks this coming year in the NBA. Yeah, Boogie Ellis. I mean, there, there, could, be, there, there could be four one-and-dones for Memphis. And that's how talented they are individually, and that's why they're picked to, to tie with Houston in the preseason poll to win it because of their individual talent. It's so incredible. They, you have to remember, I'm going to say it again, they beat out Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, North Carolina for the number one recruiting class in the country. That doesn't happen uh, very often, and that's going to really just elevate this conference even that much more. We welcome back Andy Katz after hosting three great coaches roundtables here on the stage behind us. Andy, you had a chance I to... I hope they were great. Well, we can hear them in the background. Okay, I thought all they right, sounded right, pretty good. great, but we'll let you folks at home uh, be the judge. <laughs> Andy, after having a chance to talk to all 12 head coaches, maybe talk about some more global issues and some about their programs, uh, what was probably the most interesting comment you heard a coach make today? It's Ooh, a tough question. i got to process this. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I can single well, out. Now, now you're grilling test, me. Well, test your memory I know, I know. Now here. you're grilling me. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think what we said at the beginning, I'm going to be wrong on Wichita. Uh, they're going to be better than we projected. I think that uh, Memphis uh, is embracing, you know, being the pick. Uh, the young guys are certainly looking at that. And, 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 and Wiseman and Achua, uh, they're embracing the fact that they're going to be uh, you know, expected to compete at the top and compete for a potential national championship. You know, I, I would say this. Uh, this is good for the league in that SMU and Tulsa both talked about this tournament in Fort Worth and, you know, the expectation that you're going to have a lot of SMU fans, a lot of fans that can drive there from Tulsa, from Wichita. Um, you know, that's something Tim Jankovic and... Uh, Frank Cave talked about. So I think that's, you know, I got I to gotta process all these different things that were. I think Greg Marshall around. guaranteed 5,000 um, Shocker fans. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> Wichita State, always, Wichita State always travels well. I don't care yeah. what tournament, yeah. they always do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Andy, one, one thing that I think is really interesting to follow along, and we always talk about the consistency of Cincinnati. And with Coach Brandon, it's a new style of play. I'm really interested to see. Jaron in kind of a free-flowing, open uh, kind of uh, space concept that he's going to be able to play in. He's got even more freedom to kind of showcase his skills to go along with some of the other players, Trey Scott, Keith Williams, and then you bring in Jay, uh, his cousin Javen, right. who is a lights-out three-point shooter. That off, that could be a really fun style of play to watch, but Cincinnati's maybe not used to that on the offensive end. Yeah, this was going to be interesting is to see in what way is their uh, identity changing. I think offensively they're going to do that to where they're going to be more wide open. There were times when Cincinnati, you know, had some scoring droughts, uh, and it was sort of, uh, you know, bully ball, if you will, ugly basketball time, but great defensively. The key, as John Brennan was saying, is don't lose that identity. Hmm. Make sure you're still a defensive team. Um, but offensively, I think you're right, and I talked to Cumberland as well. Can't wait to play with his cousin. Already playing with him in practice, so there's a lot of familiarity with that. I think offensively. We're going to see a much different Cincinnati. I will say this, uh, thinking back to your question, um, Aaron McKee said, you know, he didn't know where they were picked. Uh, they were picked seventh. Uh, they expect to certainly exceed those expectations. Um, Temple, I don't care what conference it's been in, they never are a team that finishes low. Uh, that you can always count on Temple to consistently be in the mix. And and Frank Haith, also at Tulsa expects them to be much better than projected in that 10 spot. All right, Andy, before we let you go, Memphis and Houston picked by the coaches to finish first in the conference this year. Who is your prediction to win the regular season, at least in this conference? Well, I have to be consistent. I went with Memphis. Uh, my concern with Houston uh, is they, the last couple of years, had been old and stayed old. They're a little younger than they've been. Uh, so that's my little knock on Houston. I get why Memphis was not picked as the clear one because of their inexperience, but I think there's just too much talent there for them not to be 
the favorite going in overall. Uh, I do agree that uh, Wichita State and USF are the two to really watch climbing up. And then if UConn stays healthy, I think they're the other one out there, that other outlier that certainly could be a tournament team. As I said at the beginning of our show, I think you're looking at seven to eight schools, SMU being that eighth, now that they're fully funded in terms of all their scholarships, I think feeling like they have a legitimate chance to be in the NCAA tournament. Mike, Not all eight are getting in, but you know they feel like that going in the tournament. They got five legit yeah. teams that that could uh, that could make it. Mike, yeah. your final thoughts on everything we've kind of talked about and learned throughout the course of today? Well, for me, the big the biggest takeaway is that battle for that first place. You know, who's is it? Memphis? Is it going to be Houston? I got to tell you, I'm having a really hard time betting against Coach Marshall in Wichita State. I think their backcourt may end up being could be the best backcourt in the American Conference. I love this South Florida team, like Andy alluded to. And again, it'll be really interesting to see, like Andy said, if UConn stays healthy, they have a freshman, James Booknight, who it might be a borderline one-and-done type player. And his talent, I actually heard a really cool story over the summer, he has not lost a one-on-one -on -one battle during the summer or practice when the coaches have been present. So he's beaten Gilbert, Vital. He has been completely dominant. It'll be fun to see Vital, Gilbert, and Booknight in that backcourt could be really dangerous come March. A lot of questions and a lot of answers to look forward to in the season to come across the American. We appreciate you joining us today at American Men's Basketball Media Day. Thanks to Andy Katz for hosting three great roundtable discussions. And thanks to Mike O'Donnell for being our trusty basketball analyst all season long. Looking forward to getting ready to go across the American. It's been a great couple hours in Philadelphia. We hope you'll join us on Facebook at 1130 a.m. for our women's show. We'll see you then.